Pandora's box is about to open wide. Welcome to Pandora's Box again, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have another special guest on the show. Today it's Brennan McMillan, who's an awesome musician from Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States. So thanks for coming across the pond to be with us today, Brennan. Uh, if not in person, yeah, absolutely. in mind and spirit. <laughs> yes, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on That's here. That's awesome. So um, as I said, what would you say you're, you're um, known most for um, as, a, as a musician, Brennan? Like put it in your own words because I don't want to... I don't want to ruin anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, obviously you're an awesome banjo player and great vocals yeah, too. Yeah, probably, probably around here I'd be known for singing first because in Nashville there's like your mailman's better at the banjo than you are, you know. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I would say singing first and then banjo and then starting to kind of get known for songwriting, I think. So. Yeah, for sure. I'm, aren't you like working on an album at the moment that I see? Yes. Yes, I've recorded 10 originals, a nice. um, little bit of a bold move, I guess. No one asked for them besides my friends, so we'll see. <laughs> and uh, then I did one cover on there. So. Do you mind me asking what the cover was? Um, it's Sweet Thing, um, which is an old standard. I think that, well, I know the Stanley Brothers did it, the Osborne Brothers did it, all the brothers, um, and so I'm doing it but a little different than the other versions, I reckon. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I know that um, I followed you on um, YouTube recently, and I absolutely loved that song Black Bear that you put up. Oh, thank you. Is that going to be on your thank album, you. or is that, that just like a random one? Yes, that it is. It's going to be on the record. Oh, nice. um, I wrote that with my friend Maddie Denton, and uh, yeah, I'd had a, a dream. I, I dream a lot, um, and I have very vivid dreams and I torture my friends with all of the details. But um, I was explaining this dream to my brother and his wife and Maddie, and we were all hanging out. And then they had both had dreams about black bears, too. And so we ended well, up. Well, that's crazy. What, a what coincidence? What, like in the same yeah. sort of time frame? Yes, <laughs> like in the same week. Yeah. Wow. So there you go, Black Bear. Yeah, I love the lyrics, the song, like everything. It's just a great song. It's super catchy. I know it's like quite short. It's not like much Thanks. more than like two minutes long, is it? Yeah, it's about two minutes on the timestamp for the record. Yeah, too, but like so. super catchy. <laughs> and I know it was like I was um I was saying to Drew, it's like like I find something funny about it. Like in like a good way though. When like at, like near the end of the song, you say about like shot it between the eyes with a forty five. <laughs> like it's yeah. really funny. Like, <laughs> but it's in a good way. Very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah, it's very dramatic, like, but that's exactly what my dream was, yeah. and so it ended up, it was like a handgun, which for me, I've gone hunting a little bit, and I know that I would not really use a handgun for a yeah, bear, sure. but I, so I, I talked to my buddy, um, and I was like, a forty-five would kill a bear, right, if I shot it between the eyes, and he was like, yeah, a black so I was bear. like, I guess I'm gonna have to go with that. Yeah, a black yeah. bear, probably not a brown bear, I imagine. Yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe know. it was I mean, between the eyes, maybe. If, yeah. If I was a sure shot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I try to be. So. That's that's cool that you've um. You, so, would you say you sort of like dabble in hunting, or would you say you're like, full, you know, is it something you want? Is it something like you're yeah. getting into and you've dabbled in a little bit? Or? I'm getting right. into it. Yes, yes. And I've gotten one deer now, and I would love to go hunting more. Oh. Um. It's yeah. It's really fun, and it's very emotional, very meditative, and very useful i you know had meat in my freezer for a year so Man, i think i think it's the the best way to live like to be a hunter it's very hard yeah. in the uk to be a hunter just because um it's we're a very small country but we have like very big mm -hmm. cities even though we're a very small country oh, so yeah. you know, as i'm sure you well know like london is um you know a massive 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 city but you know like you look on uh, yeah. like uh, the uk on a map i think like I think like England's smaller than Texas, for example, which is only just oh, like, wow. which is, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a big state. I think it's like your second biggest state, isn't it? But it's still, it's like just one U S state, yeah. isn't it? You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, um, we do have some really nice um, woodland here, but a lot of it is like really, if you want to hunt, um, you need to find like some farm or something that owns like a ridiculous amount of acres of land. And then maybe if he's having some trouble because some like some deer or something is like ruining his property and you get in good yeah. with him, then or her they might let you hunt on their property but other than that it can be quite hard to do 
but um oh yeah to find land yeah but i think it's like the most i think it's the best way to live for sure like as a hunter i think it's yeah. like the most ethical i think it's like spiritually if you want to go down that route i think it's the best and as you said it's like a an emotional thing to do but it makes you like in tune with your food and like respect it oh yeah for sure i i definitely kind of had a lot of tears when i <laughs> got my deer and then um you know even leading up to that i probably had spent like 12 or so hours you know sitting still in the deer stand uh that day and the day previous to it and sitting that still and quiet like one with nature Mm. is like a very it gives you a whole different perspective on the on the forest life Mm -hmm. you know like you're hearing every single little detail that's happening like even a squirrel sounds kind of like an elephant Mm -hmm. you know when it when it's starting to mess around with stuff because you're just so used to the quiet, you know, and you're, you're being so quiet yourself, you know, and it's, it's so it's very calming and you have to learn to sit still, which is hard in today's, yeah, sure. you know, We're a fidgety hustle bunch. and bustle. Yeah. So, oh, I'm so fidgety. <laughs> I had to basically wiggle my toes inside my shoes. <laughs> um, and I would just wiggle my toes. Like every time I felt like, like twitching and stuff, you know, because I just, I was, like, getting stir-crazy a little bit, but I had to just, okay, i got to sit here and be still. Sure. It was good. I think another good thing about it is it, like, like reminds you that we are, like, a part of the food chain as much as anything else. I think sometimes, like, a lot of people think that we they see us as almost outside of the food chain looking in, but, like, we're not. And I think, like, if you're doing something like hunting, even if you just spend a lot of time in nature, I think, you know, you're, like, you realize, you know, we're a part of nature the same as everything else we're a part of the food chain and say if you're like hunting if you mess up then uh that's on you you have not like succeeded as Mm -hmm. a predator that day and it can even be dangerous i mean there's a chance that you know you could get hurt yourself you know and that's just that's that's like part of nature you know so yeah it brings out a little primal instinct and you know defense mechanisms and all kinds of stuff it's it's good yeah i'm a really (laughs) big fan of um you know steven ranella you don't know about Stephen yeah. I think he's like one of the biggest I'm... hunters in the US. Uh, well, if you ask me names about anybody, oh, I barely... Fair play. I'm not a name person. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, yeah, I know. I probably have seen his stuff or something. Yeah, I know. It's like, like some of my friends, like, you know, they remember every single name or like musicians. Do you know what I mean? They were like every single musician. They'll know everything about that musician, <laughs> about every yeah. album they wrote. And then other musician friends of mine or whatever. Drew's like this. Like, he, you know, he won't know anybody's name <laughs> or anything about. Yeah. You know what I mean? He'll be like, I liked it. <laughs> who was that guy man that um he he was talking on joe rogan about the the bear that came into the camp steven ranella is that steven ranella yeah, yeah, oh because yeah. i was oh. it, and that that, hey, that story sounded mad. Rogan. yeah <laughs> yeah so so steve ranella if you're if you're getting into hunting you you should look him up because he's he's a genius he's a he's a writer i've got some of his books um i've got his book meat eater um which is all about hunting it's almost like a um it's just almost like a guide to hunting and it helps you almost like little recipes for like everything from like li- little game oh, cool. right up to elk or bear, whatever. Um, yeah. But he's a super cool guy. He's very intelligent, but he's just been a hunter all his life. Really cool guy. He's got like um, a channel as well on um, on YouTube, which I'm pretty sure is just called Meat Eater as well. Um, so yeah, you should check that out. But it's definitely like worth watching yeah. if you're into if you're into because it's apart from anything else, like say his shows on YouTube, it's like really interesting. It, one of his videos would be like black bear hunting in Alaska, and then it'll be like you know hunting wild boar in Texas, and then another one will be like turkey nice. hunting. You know, it's very interesting if you're into if you're yeah, into hunting. Totally. And, and I think I you am. can like <laughs> learn a bit just from watching it. You know, like you learn quite a lot just from watching it. You know, and yeah, I think um, and I think you know even just being out in, in, in the outdoors and just like hiking miles you know as well i mean that's oh yeah it's great for you i love going on walks and stuff like that and it but it is it is way different walking through somewhere and then just sitting there and trying to assimilate with like mm. a tree mm. <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> for long periods of time sitting and yeah. connecting is that like is, yeah. is like hunting something that you grew up with, or is it something that you've gotten into like more consciously as a choice, or more recently? Yeah, um, yeah. Growing up, my dad started hunting some like later in high school, 
uh, when us kids were later in high school. But I have seven brothers, and so, like, I wasn't going to be the first to pick maybe to take out um, hunting, although he took me shooting quite a lot um, at the end of high school. But, um, yeah, I just it had never really... Uh, the opportunity hadn't arisen and then until recently kind of got into it so nice nice what made you what what do you think it was about it that made you want to get into it um well i guess my boyfriend and his family they they are big into hunting and then um basically the opportunity came up and so his dad was kind of showing me the ropes Mm. um and i loved it awesome so. <laughs> do you think um did you, what did you say it was um did you say it was elk that you hunted or that you deer, it was just, deer? just uh, yeah so like what's mm -hmm. the i mean i don't even know if you know so don't don't feel like i'm putting you on the spot because i know you have you oh, have yeah. what are the different deer species that you have in the u.s do you even know <laughs> sorry <laughs> you're like man all right, i'm not like a freaking wildlife expert dude <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> um i think i think these are just white-tailed deer. Oh, just white-tailed deer. That, okay, I know what a white-tailed deer yeah. is. Okay. Okay, yeah. These were white-tailed deer. I know that there's another one out towards the west that are smaller mm. um, size and stature, but they're called something that I can't To be remember. fair, there's a lot of um, different... around here... Yeah, there's a lot of different types of, of um, deer and things like deer in the US, to be fair. I know that, like, so in the UK, we have um, our biggest deer, like red deer, and they're very closely yeah. related to elk like in what you know the elk that you would find in in the u.s yeah. but obviously so like a red stag yeah yeah you'd have like a big stag. and they're like yeah. big and it, from a distance you'd probably think it was an elk um but mm -hmm. elk um obviously don't have that red coloring and apparently it's like you know if you go back far enough in history then they would have been the same creature but then as yeah you know as yeah. as like the ice melted and stuff in the ice age like they became two different species and but I think I think you yeah. know yeah as I said obviously red deer as the name implies are have a reddish tinge whereas uh, whereas American <laughs> elk are more just um, like brownie colored I guess aren't they brown yes yeah and we have some I think I think the ones that I was hunting are a little darker in color compared to the ones out west and then maybe they're a little bigger um, but we we have such a diverse like environment like different ecosystems across the u.s oh, the, yeah, mad. we have such a range of species everywhere because like there's just such difference in in terrain yeah. and re weather and like all kinds of stuff that makes a huge difference like and it's a pretty big country so yeah i think that's, i think that's one of the craziest things about the u.s to me um well, i've been to the u.s like a couple of times um, but i think you know i'd always want to keep coming back because it's like it's not like one of those countries where it's like you've been there and you've seen it. Do you know what I mean? Like you need like if I if I right. went to the US like once a month for the rest of my life, I wouldn't see it all before I died. You know, like Oh yeah. I haven't I haven't seen everything there is to see here and I would love yeah. to. Um because I you know, I think it was my first time last year mm. I went out on a gig to California and that was my first time like that far. It was my first time to the Pacific Coast. Yeah, Pacific. Um Right? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, like, Pacific Coast in America, I had gone to it in Nicaragua and Costa Rica before, but I hadn't been from the American side. And so that was cool and new. And then, you know, I went to Washington maybe the year before that, but I haven't been out west as much. Mm. Um, I've mostly stayed in the southeast. Sure. And I haven't even gone up to those northern states. Um, I haven't like been to Michigan or like Maine or anything, you know. Um, so one one of the things there's so much undiscovered. Yeah, sure. <laughs> one of the, one of the places really on my bucket list is Montana. I really would like to go to Montana. Oh yes, I haven't gone. I would love to. I go. mean, yeah, I just think you yeah. look at like uh, pictures of Montana or videos of Montana, and that's almost like what I am like if like that's almost like my heaven. <laughs> You know, it's like yeah, yeah. You know, like woodland, like lots of creeks yeah. and woods, rivers and, and beautiful lakes, and icy yeah. mountains, like snowy mountains and stuff. It's like absolutely yeah. like it's a beautiful place. And what like I can imagine it'd be a very nice place to live. Like you'd not have to know your yeah. stuff well, because if you were living rural, if you don't want to be around people that much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm like weird like that though. I'm For like sure. I'm like a friendly guy, but I'm also pretty antisocial. So like I like to have my yeah. space and stuff. You know, like, uh, yeah. don't want to be like, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, I'll be friendly to anybody. And if I like, say I drove past somebody and they were like broken down or something, I would always stop and help them. Like a neighbor, I always help them. But I, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be like in a room with loads and loads of people. Like, like 
all yeah. the time, you know? I'm more of a one-on-one person, too. I, yeah. I like groups, but I can get stressed out because I want yeah. to make sure, like, everyone's happy as if it's my job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I'll get, like, stressed and be like, okay, so-and-so's talking to so-and-so. I hope they're having a good conversation. <laughs> and then maybe this person needs to be introduced to this person. And, like, I just get all, like, mom. That's, that's, that's nice, though. That's something. coming from a good but, place. It shows that you're really uh, <laughs> nice and that you've got really good manners, which is... Oh, well. That's great. My parents raised me with pretty good manners. I would say they they're very strict about me. Yeah. <laughs> so. Did you we did you grow up in yes. in uh, Tennessee in Nashville or? No, um, I'm from Kentucky, from Kentucky. originally. Yeah. Home of the so, famous that fried far, chicken. But... <laughs> That's right. Yeah, KFC, and then my hometown made a famous. Well, I don't know how famous it is, but a soft drink that we are so a proud of. A soft drink. Um. Yes. Uh. It's like. It's called A Late One, oh. and it's basically because it sounds like a late one, mm. and it's a ginger ale basically oh, that has caffeine. Wow, that sounds amazing! Yeah. Oh, ginger yeah, ale, and caffeine. it's really good. Yeah, I'm gonna because then you pop a cold one on a Saturday, you get all your work done. You know, man, I love that. Get a buzz on. When we finish <laughs> this, I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna message you and ask if you can write down that name of that drink, and I'll see if I can order some from oh, the UK. Yeah. I don't know. It might even just be yeah, able to get on I Amazon. Wonder... It's so random nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, they they have they only carry them in like specialty like Cracker Barrels mm. here have them, and some of the grocery stores have them in like a specialty soda area. But they aren't everywhere, like even here. So it's mm. it's an exciting item, you know. Isn't isn't Jim Bean <laughs> like the whiskey? That's also from Kentucky, isn't it? Oh yep, yeah. We've got a Jack lot Daniel's of Jack Daniel's rival distilleries. Have that, yeah. Jack. Yeah, Jack Daniels, and then there's also like uh, this other one that's one word. Um, what, like a whiskey? Yeah, tons of bourbon whiskey in Is Kentucky. There? Like, man, I yes, like that's... me and Drew both like our whiskey, but obviously oh, over no. here we <laughs> yes. drink more like single malts and stuff, like Scottish whiskey and stuff. Yeah. But any whiskey is good whiskey, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I'm sober now, but my drink was whiskey yeah. back in the day, and I love it. Yeah, yeah, loved it, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. What was that? Um, what made you decide to go sort of like straight with the uh, booze? Just um, well, I was given an ultimatum. Basically, like uh, my brother <laughs> said, he didn't want to play music with me anymore unless I got sober. Were you just so. like super rowdy or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Really? literally>, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I had a problem with it. I think I drank too much yeah. all the time. I would never stop. So then I would be useless for about two days recovering hmm. from like a hangover. And then, you know, I'd go right back to it. So I, it was just not pleasant to be around or to try to be productive with me. I was not very productive, like on hangover days. And, you know, then at a certain point in the evenings, if, you know, depending on how drunk I got. So I just didn't have it. I never had a stopping point. And even though I would try every once in a while, I'd like try to, you know, dial it back. But I I could dial it back if it was like wine or, or beer because I don't really care for yeah, those as sure. much. But for whiskey, I just, <laughs> I just keep, you know, drinking all night. Yeah, so. that's how we learn though, isn't it? You know, I mean, if you hadn't sort of gone a bit like crazy like that and gone through a stage of just partying hard like that then you'd have never oh, have yeah. become straight edge like you are now with it yeah i know i'm i'm grateful that you know i i'm kind of someone who has to experience something before i know if it's bad or good for me so i think that's i think that's uh <laughs> you know? shows like having a pretty sensible smart mind though really because if you just go yeah. by what people tell you then that's just sort of like being a sheep isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, exactly you got to yeah. experience or, it for yourself or some people some people have like a, a moral compass that they know what's going to be good or not for them ahead of time. Like they don't have to be told or, or they don't have to, mm-hmm. you know, go through something. Really I guess it hard. depends you on know, the subject, it doesn't it? It depends pleasant, like but, what you're talking about, yes. I guess. Like some things are obviously uh, like quote unquote bad and mm. some yeah. things are a bit more subjective. Like you could say having yeah, a drink, there's nothing wrong with that. But then if you're having a drink right. to the point of it being destructive to you and the people around you, then that is clearly a problem. Yeah, that's one thing. Like when I got sober, I mean, I'm still in bars every night, like mm. playing music or my friends are playing. And so immediately, like 
my friends would be like, do you want me to stop drinking around you? And I'm like, no, I'm going to have to be able to do this like, and be around alcohol all the time. So please, you know, carry on as usual and I will deal with it myself, you know, like, so, you know, cause I don't think it's bad for everybody to drink, but I think there's a few people yep. that shouldn't drink. Oh, I'm, I, I completely agree with you. There's some people I know that I knew that they would never admit, but they have like a drinking problem. And I knew that they'd probably even get like a- aggro if I like said to them that that was mm-hmm. the case. And that's probably, that <laughs> yeah. probably says, says it all really, doesn't it? But, um, and then, yeah, but then there's loads of people I know that drink like semi-regularly and um, it's absolutely fine. They can have like a drink or two, yeah. with you know, or just drink socially, whatever. And it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Yep. All kinds of levels. Yeah. For everything. <laughs> so did you say you um, play music with your brother? Do you still play music with your brother? Yes. Yeah. We we had a band. Um, we started in 2018 here in Nashville. Um, when I moved down here, we we had no intention of starting a full band, but we played one gig like a week after I moved down here, and then we had this gig scheduled at Station Inn um, here in Nashville, and we realized we needed a full band for mm-hmm. that, and um so we put together a band and then we were like whoa we love that so we kind of kept it as a full band and you know always made ourselves available as a duo or trio for private events too along the way but we we kind of loved the full band sound um just brings a little more life into Mm -hmm. all the music you know so we we were doing that for a couple years and then of course covid stuff happened and then um we still did a bunch of like live streaming and everything in 21 and 22 or 20 and 21. And then we did a tour again, um, in 22 and maybe in 23. And then we've kind of, he got married and, uh, you know, then we kind of discussed doing some of our own stuff. Um, so we sort of started transitioning into doing our own projects and, He's currently recording a rock album, nice. which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so what does he play? Yeah, and then I've he plays guitar um, and piano, and uh, then of course I play banjo and some guitar. Oh. So Do you, does he um, sing as well? Yeah, nice. yeah. He's a great singer. He's a really prolific songwriter. He's he's done a lot of writing for many artists in the bluegrass industry here, and uh, so I'm very proud of him. But yeah, yeah. we. We're very happy to be doing our own thing, but we still we're still like booking private gigs for us, so we can just you know sure. make a little dough on the side, you know. But I'd love to check him out. I'd love to listen to <laughs> um, some of his rock stuff because I'm into like loads of different genres of music. But one of the one of the oh, genres yeah. I am really into is rock, so I'd love to check that out. Oh yeah, well his name's Theo Macmillan. Yeah, same spelling. Awesome. As mine, yeah, of course, I'll check so. him out. I'll check him out. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Does he have like any? He might not even know the answer to this. Does he have any like big rock influences? Do you know of, or has he sort of always listened to rock growing up? Or oh yeah, he loves Paul Simon and Sting and probably um, what's it, Phil Collins and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of CCM artists as well, like Stephen Curtis Chapman and um, you know maybe I don't know. Who As else. Southerners, you got to love Lennon Skinner, yeah. right? Oh, uh, I don't really care about rock. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I was sort of like partly joking, but man, I love Lennon and Skinhead. They are freaking cool. And they were like really yeah, flying the flag to... for like Southern rock back in the day. Yeah. Oh, I, I went to a Def Leppard show oh, yeah? and it was cool, but <laughs> I don't, I don't really drama? like care that much about like, I like, I'll go see in any genre live, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I can enjoy that. But as far as what I go to to listen, I never listen to rock i mean i listen to some sting and paul simon too but not like on purpose <laughs> sure i know i know what you mean i know what you mean um so you know if it comes up i'm like oh, cool, so do you yeah. pretty much just like exclusively listening to bluegrass eyes like in your spare time i listen to bluegrass and a lot of folk a lot oh, so you like a lot of folk music then? you would awesome. yes folk and and um Country, mm. old country. What are some of your favorite um, um, folk country artists, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, yeah, let's see here. Towns um, Van Zandt? Well, I like Gillian, Gillian Welch. Oh, I love Gillian Welch. Yes, I, I love Gillian Welch. 
Yes, and then um, I like uh, who do I like? Well, Gordon Lightfoot, Tony Rice, all of that stuff, which is strung through bluegrass. Yeah, but it's sort of dabble. Really a lot, a lot of these artists dabble songs. in and out of of diff- those different subgenres, yeah. like country folk, bluegrass, don't they? A lot of these artists. I only discovered yeah. Tony Rice really recently mm-hmm. as a thing. On, on, oh, wow. oh, and like, yeah, I, I'm I don't know so much about like um, American kind of bluegrass stuff and that, but his guitar playing was insane. His flat picking, oh, I was like, whoa, it's the best. Yeah, so good. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's probably one of the most enjoyable. Like, I will listen to him play guitar, and I will listen to him sing, like, so on purpose, because he's, like, excellent at both, and you don't really find that, like, all the time. Mm. Like, I'll listen to an instrumental from him, and I'll also listen to, you know, a song, a singing one from him, because he's, he's so, there's like a raw... Mm smooth mm. grit i don't even know how to say in his voice and then like his playing is just unbelievable like even his rhythm and backup and stuff it's like whoa you know um and you should write down hard love by him hard it's love like one of the coolest songs i kind of love sad stuff me too to be honest he's got a bunch of oh yeah it's the best <laughs> <laughs> i think that's where like all the... to feel some emotion yeah and i feel like it's like it's hard to pour a lot of a meaning in meaning into like a super major happy song. Like, don't get me wrong, there's like a place for it, but I think like mm-hmm. those like beautiful minor songs where people are pouring their hearts out into it, like those are the ones that hit you in the oh, fields yeah. and get your your hairs on end, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. He he did a lot of Gordon Lightfoot covers and also um what is the other guy's name? There's another guy that he did a bunch of his songs mm. too and they're just both like incredible songwriters and it's very folky songs, mm. but then Tony did them. So they, they have this element of grass in there yeah. and it's, it's really cool. And then, um, I love Dolly Parton, of course. She's a legend. And, oh yeah. She's a legend and her early stuff, like, man, some of her songs are so bold for the times and like also just beautiful and sad. And, um, yeah, I just love, all of her stuff. Uh, I watched a really cool... But mostly the early. Yeah, sorry. No, sorry to cut you off. I watched a really cool video of her recently in like a little bar in Ireland. Um, and in mm-hmm. Ireland, they have... Um, in lots of places in the UK, more like places like Ireland, and there's this little island called the Isle of Man, and it's places in Scotland. But in bars there, it's super common um, for like musicians will just rock up, and they'll all just be sit together, and sometimes there'll be like 20 musicians. It's basically whoever turns up and whoever knows the song oh, yeah. you join in. And she, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, she'd gone into like a pub in Ireland, and she just had like joined in with them. And man, the videos, the videos, great. <laughs> I'm were... sure you can find it if you just put in like Dolly Parton in Ireland or something like that. Oh, but yeah. it's, it's it's fantastic. And she's that. like so down to earth as well. By this point in her career, she, I think it was like in the 90s or something. So she was already like super famous, you know. Wow. And um, yeah. it was really cool to see. That's cool. I I love Ireland, and I love that pub um, vibe. I. I went over in 2017 for like a month. We were in Denmark and Ireland, and awesome places uh, to go. It was those, those two places because oh, yeah. Denmark's amazing as well. Yeah, Denmark. We were in Denmark first, and then we went to Ireland. Where in Denmark did you go? Did you go to Copenhagen? Um, we landed in Copenhagen. Well, that was Amsterdam, I guess. Right? No, no. Um, Is Copenhagen? No, Copenhagen in Amsterdam? Or no, we landed in Amsterdam, went to Copenhagen, yeah. and then we basically. We're on the western coast the whole time, and we started. So you started in in Amsterdam, and just followed the coast up to Copenhagen, in Denmark. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's that's probably what you did. I think that would make sense to me. Yeah, there was something at the top where the I think it was like the Baltic Sea and this other sea like me North Sea. I expect the the North Sea probably. Yeah. That was epic. Mm. Like, I think the thing about Denmark was that it was so gorgeous. Mm. Like, all the sand dunes and, like, little country cottages. Yep. It was, like, kind of stuff that I'd only seen in movies. Yep. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. A lot um, of culture, a lot of nice food. Home of the Danish pastry. I mean, Danish pastries. Don't know about you, Brian, oh, yeah. but I love a Danish the, pastry. The Danish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That, it was funny because they don't call them Danishes there, obviously. Mm. And uh, there's... Uh, 
Kaj or something. I, I'm always picking up words in other countries and I forget them completely when I leave. But um, <laughs> yeah, sure. they thought it was hilarious because we talked to a few people like that we call pastries Danishes. Mm. Like they're like, we are Danish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like not the pastries. I guess it's weird if you think about you know? it. Like imagine calling like a food yeah. item like an American. American. <laughs> yeah, or like something, you know, like I'm eating an American. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they, they got a big kick out of that. Yeah. They were like, that's silly, you know. But um, And then we went to Ireland and then we probably spent like every night from like 4 p.m. to like 4 a.m. in the pubs yeah. singing with people and jamming and you know drinking guinness and jameson and it's like amazing yeah i think that's like <laughs> i i think that's like uh music in its purest form like to me uh like you know when you just get together mm-hmm. with other musicians and you just sort of jam um it's yeah, very like yeah. pure and, and sort of beautiful you know there's no um, you know it's just i love that i love that thing about music it's probably yeah. my favorite thing about music yeah something i probably take for granted here in nashville because we get to do you know because everybody lives here or not everybody, but, you know, Pretty a much. lot of people <laughs> yeah. that work in the bluegrass bands that, mm. you know, like, live here. And so you call a jam in town and you, you're getting all kinds of people showing up and it's awesome. And then, like, but there's not, you know, ego-centric stuff going yeah. on. It, that's, that's I mean, there's a little bit of, of like, to. you have that's to That's part of what prove. I was alluding to, yeah. Yeah, yeah you've got to, you know, you're going to have to hold your own, mm. you know, if you're going to keep up. But, like... Also, anybody can jam, you know. It's more about your confidence level, not about your playing level, I think, mm. for, for jams and to be able to enjoy a jam. Yeah, and I guess um, a lot of things, it's like not just how good you are in your instruments, how creative you are maybe, like different things, as you said, confidence. Yeah. There's so many so yeah, many. Yeah, not being afraid to step outside of the break that you know on that song and like try something new, you know, like people are going to respect that. And I think that was a huge thing for me when I first moved here because – before I moved here, I really was in just, you know, high school and college. So I didn't, I didn't have time to practice. Well, I was in sports and stuff too. And, but I didn't really practice except for gigs. So that I would just work at breaks for songs in those set lists, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to improv at all. And I got here and I was like, Oh, everyone, is jumping in on this song that only like two people out of the 20 know, you know? And I was like, how is, how's everybody doing that? Mm. So I, I had to like get a new relationship with my instrument because, you know, I had to familiarize myself and figure out things and, and get really more, you know, locked into the program kind of. Yeah, that's, Um, that's one of the things I think is, uh, one of my favorite things about like folk music and stuff. I think, um, because I, I have, so many musician friends but um like i have like a lot of friends that are in like rock bands or like metal bands or all sorts of different bands you know like you know just acoustic Mm -hmm. acts or pianists whatever but um a lot of them that aren't into like folk or country or anything like that it's a bit more like write a song play a song or something (laughs) you know it's it's it's, and and there's there's, uh, obviously there's nothing wrong with that but it's very different whereas like folk music and obviously i guess like country and and bluegrass or came came out of that like evolved out of that it's very much like if you've got an instrument and you want to join in you can join in and we're just going to go for a little ride and see what happens and i love like the the freedom and the looseness of that and it's not like well you're not in our band so why are you playing with us it's not anything like weird like that but like in a lot of bands it would be like that you know, but like, yeah, in folk, yeah. You, just, you can get up on stage with somebody and play with somebody, you know, it's like, cool, you know, or or just jam yeah, and have a fat jam in. or whatever, you know, and just, as you said, improvise, get creative and just sort of see what happens. Like, oh, yeah, just play whatever melody you want on, on your guitar over this or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's really cool. And of course, there's a, a lot more traditional music um, in bluegrass and folk that cross over. And so, you know, a lot of people know the standards, you know, like jazz or whatever, like, and so everybody's able to hop in comfortably on those, you know, because there's kind of a similar pattern in all of those mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, um, it's more like intuitive to where it goes because it's based on like a traditional sound, you know, it. so you have those and then you've got people that will, you know, be like, hey, I just wrote this one. Can we try to play it? It's just this, this, this. And then you, then it's cool because you get a fresh sound going on in the jam. And sometimes it's a jam buster if you play an original, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, most of the time everybody, 
you know, can can get with it, and then you get to hear how that would sound, mm. you know, with a full band. So yeah, that's so cool. cool. That's so cool. Um, did you move to Nashville because of the music scene? No. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess not. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, well, my brother moved here first, and um, we did want to play music together, but this is a, it's an industrial town, you know, an advancing city, and so we both knew we could get jobs within our degrees here um, and then be able to be here for music if that ended up happening, mm. basically. Um, so, you know, I got my lab job a few weeks after I moved down here, um, and because I'm a chemist, and so basically, then we just happened to start a band at the same time oh, that's as cool. I moved down here. Yeah, it's funny. I just assumed that you would probably have, would have moved because Nashville is so famous all across the world for the music scene. Um, and obviously, yes. especially for things like bluegrass, folk and stuff. And as you said, there's so many artists in Nashville. I just assume that you probably moved there for the music oh, scene. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, I definitely moved. I think we we kind of subconsciously picked it because it'd be a good place to start playing music. But it was also a good place for our day mm. jobs and not too far from Kentucky and everything. Yeah, sure. So, um, it just seemed like a good hub for everything that we wanted to do if we were going to pursue that. And I, I probably didn't really, I don't think ahead that far. So uh, I, I wasn't really thinking. Oh, that, that's good. So that you just, music would you say that's like your just like general life philosophy? You like to just go with the flow, Like you don't like to plan too far yes. ahead. Yes. I like, I like to plan a few things like maybe my groceries per week. Yeah, yeah sure. But, <laughs> yeah, well, that's just sensible, <laughs> wouldn't it, you know? But, yeah, I mean, as far as, like, even this record, I basically just decided to do it in, like, November, and then I started recording in December. And nice. And now I'm, like, So you're just flying off the seat of your pants it. with that stuff, like, just, yes. I'm going to write an album. I'm going to, uh, okay, start start doing it. Yes, but I, but I, once I've decided to do something, then I'm doing you're it. All in. Like, focusing on it so i mean we've got like one more thing to do and then we're done um and i've just got to help finish mixing it with the engineer and then then it's done have you like announced the name of your album yet no i haven't okay okay (laughs) i won't i won't ask you then but yeah make sure um when it when it comes out i'll get in contact with you and if you're happy to send over some tracks i'll make sure we we play it on air and and play it on um, aw radio lots you know over here to try and get you some exposure in the uk and that yeah absolutely i I should have yeah i think i'll be probably releasing three or four singles first too so awesome we can i'll send those yeah that'd be amazing um, as they happen Mm -hmm. i don't know yeah well those are happening i'm hoping to put out one maybe this month but i don't know yeah well as i said i absolutely love (laughs) love black bear so if it's like anything like that then yeah i I thought like even the video it was like obviously quite like a simple video but even your video for it was just really nicely done like real beautiful video oh thank you yeah jesse whedon he's like uh he's just like a musician's man Mm. here um he's he's all about trying to help um musicians like get their names out and like do things for them he's really amazing and so he had reached out about some videos and i was like oh this would be awesome and um so yeah he he just did that it was very simple setting like and that where we filmed it was like kind of like the edge of a parking lot it's not even like that yeah oh i thought it was like it looks like it's like in proper nature doesn't it like that's the impression you get i know i know yeah so that's it's great um he did really well because it looks Looks great, Super but it was nice and cool. low budget yeah. to make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bang for your buck. Exactly. Bang for your buck. <laughs> yeah. No, like, um, do you ever think, as like a musician yourself, it's sort of like crazy how big the music scene in Tennessee is? Because as somebody that works in radio, one thing we were talking earlier on about how big the US is, like the majority of people that send music to me or get in contact with me from the US are from Tennessee. I've had a punk band today oh, wow. called a punk band from Tennessee called Big Bombs that were emailing me, emailing me earlier on. Um, a band I've gotten to know like pretty well, who I'm sort of like message fairly often, um, called um, Lady Owl, the lead singer of that um, band called uh, it's called Johnny. It's sort of like psychedelic rock music. 
they're really cool guys. <laughs> yeah. But it's just mad. It's like the amount of like, emails I get through, and I'm like, okay, yeah, let's check this out. And it's like, oh, yeah, they're a uh, Tennessee or like it's either like Nashville or Memphis, Tennessee based band. Memphis, and I'm yeah. like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> yeah. I think with like Nashville being like country, bluegrass, folk, Americana, and then Memphis with the rock mm. and roll and like, I don't know what else. Yeah. They do over there, but, like, <laughs> yeah. there's two huge music hubs, yeah. you know, with those two cities, and then otherwise it's, like, maybe, you know, Austin, Texas has a bunch mm. of music going on, more, like, outlaw country type of stuff, and and then, of course, California has, like, all the pop and Yeah, all stuff the rubbish like stuff. But there, there no, are no some, joking. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, but I'm just trying yeah. to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there's good pop and bad yeah, pop. Yeah, no, like no, I know. Good bluegrass yeah. and bad yeah, bluegrass. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Know? So, um, and there's, I think there's, well, you could say there's a lot of country pop that comes out of Nashville now. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's good or bad, we won't. Yeah, see. I mean, I, I'm, I predominantly listen to more like, um, I'm like a, I'm like an old man, really, like in my, in my heart. Like I listen to say like a lot of mm-hmm. old stuff more. I know you said, um, like you know, Gillian Welch, like, I'm a big fan of hers. I said yeah. um, like Towns Van Zant's one of my favorite artists of all time. I know you were talking earlier about like how like you know sad sort of minor songs mean a lot to you. Like I think to somebody that maybe isn't a fan like really into music, um, <laughs> and especially if you're not into like sad music, his music probably just come across almost as like depressing, like a lot of it, because mm-hmm. it's a lot of it is like talking about like death and like loads of sad subjects. A lot of it's like really heartbreaking love stories and stuff, but like really quite like sad, you know um but yeah yeah i love like towns van zandt and blaze foley rest in peace um blaze foley you know um a lot of artists like that you know some of the old school guys but then saying that um you know being a massive fan of like yours since i've heard your stuff like angela autumn's freaking awesome um i, I oh, saw yes. that um you're, you're good friends with christina vane i think she's awesome Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've been like following her for a, for a couple of years now. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is there definitely is some some really good new stuff coming out, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, well, almost. I feel like all my friends are putting out albums this year, so <laughs> <laughs> it's really been fun. Um, like Bronwyn, Keith Hines, Christina Vane, Hilary Klug, um, and then probably East Nashgrass will put out another record. Uh, this year or something um, and it's just like oh Mallory Eagle and yeah there's just tons of people that I know that are putting out albums this year and we're it's just going to be flooding yeah. <laughs> and you are now the market too. with new music <laughs> yes I guess I'm hoping to get it out by late summer maybe fall but awesome we'll see what happens <laughs> are you like one of those people that just like like gigs like flat out all the time i know that when we were talking to angela she was just saying that like you know she just tries to gig like as much as she possibly can as she possibly can are you the same or yeah pretty much well i don't know i because i have my day job mm. like i i always work around that but i do a lot of in-town gigs so like you know, pick up band bar gigs and stuff like that. Um, and that's been really fun. I've done that for like a couple of years now, mm. basically like sideman gigs. And then as, as I get closer to releasing my record, I'm, I've already been getting emails, but I guess I haven't like officially put out a statement that's saying like, I'm available to book, but I guess I will sometime soon or kind of like put a section on my website. Um, but yeah, I will be like proactive about it um, sooner to my album release. Yeah, but, you sure. know, sometimes like if, if no one has anything of your solo sound to go off of, like, why are they going to book you? So I'm kind of waiting to have that to go along with me mm. somewhere. So. You know. you know when you said earlier on about you going to like um amsterdam and and copenhagen and, mm-hmm. and ireland and stuff was that like to play music was that was that to like tour like to gig yeah. oh awesome yeah that was uh with the college band i played with um the berea college bluegrass ensemble and that was a blast yeah he uh al white who was in charge at the time he treated it like a professional band and so we would go on tours and stuff mm. Um, all the time and it was so fun that we got to have that experience because 
I think it was that trip because we were going to be gone for like, I don't know, 20 days or something. Um, that trip, I was like, okay, if I enjoy this, then this seems like it would be a good thing for me to pursue. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, then I should probably like get a little more serious about lab life or whatever, you know? So I, I loved living out of my suitcase and I loved just seeing new places and, and everything. I also enjoyed coming home and like doing my laundry, but <laughs> but I, <laughs> I think that's like balance, that, isn't it? You know, I love it's it. like it's like yeah. people that say, oh, you know, they wish it was summer all the time. I think, well, you know, you don't because if it wasn't, if you didn't have winter, how would you ever appreciate like summer? You know, it's a bit like exactly. that. If you're not, if yes. you're, how would you appreciate like coming home and doing your, do you know, doing your laundry? Um, if you hadn't mm-hmm. spent all that time like on the road, busy, like you know, like constantly traveling, you know? Yeah. Yeah, by the end, you're definitely like, okay, I wish I had the capability to bring, like, way more of my closet along. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, besides that, I I enjoyed it every second of it. Oh, man, the food. The food was so fun. What, I love food. What, so. Yeah, oh, man, me too. Me too. What, what, in, like, any place in particular that you went to you thinking of? or? I feel like Denmark's food was really unique for me because we were on the coast the whole time mm-hmm. so it was like all this like sea caught mm-hmm. like like they would have like caviar and stuff like on your tip like we did a lot of seafood platters and stuff mm-hmm. and I'm you know here caviar is like expensive mm-hmm. and fancy and there it was like pretty common and so that was cool just to have a lot of caviar and like lobster and this fish and that fish and yeah whatever blah 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 and then um then irish food was cool but the drinks were better yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah lots of, but, lots of like pies and stuff in ireland yeah a lot of like shepherd's pies or like meatloaf or like just potatoes. <laughs> potato. It was a little heavier. <laughs> potato. <laughs> yeah. yeah, obviously I had to chuck in potato yeah. there because it's, you know, Ireland. You can't mention Ireland yes. without talking about potatoes. But yeah, to be yes. honest, Irish food's yeah. like, yeah, it's basically the same as like English food. Yeah, just like, eat the same stuff. But I mean, yeah. I think it's like um, if you aren't afraid of it, do you know what I mean? Like I think probably as, as an American person, some people in America might hear like some horror stories about British food. But I mean, we are like, our roast dinners we have like roast dinners pretty much it's like it's a tradition in in the uk we have a roast dinner every sunday roast. which is basically like the same thing as like you know like your thanksgiving meal or something you know it's like we have that pretty much every yeah. every sunday um you know uh what we call english breakfast but then in ireland they call it irish breakfast but it's the same thing which is basically you know we just like the blood pudding black pudding yeah but yeah but you call it blood yeah. pudding we call it just black pudding in 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 uh in the uk but yeah so it's like yes yeah, yeah, so it is it didn't bother it's made me, of blood yeah but... it tastes delicious yeah. You, would you would you yeah, be up for I that? Yeah, it was great. I felt like I felt like it was good for me nutritionally, oh, yeah. you know, like and I'm all about that. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't leave plates with food on them usually because you know, unless it's just like I got too much or whatever, but I I like to I like variety on my plate and I just want to try everything and then, you know, I don't want it to go to waste you, either. You're so. my sort of person, Brenna. I'm always I'm always getting on my missus because whenever we eat food, like regardless of anything we eat, I always finish everything on my plate. And she she always makes a point of it. I swear she just does it just to annoy me. She always like leaves something and it just bugs me for some reason. I think I'm like a completionist or something. Like, do you know what I mean? I like to complete things. Uh, so it just sort of mm-hmm. like bugs me and I'm like wait can you just eat that last thing and she's like oh no I'm full and I'm like oh, for god's sake it's just winding me up yes. you know <laughs> yep we I grew up with I have nine siblings from Liberia West Africa that's crazy and yeah and so <laughs> we we ate a lot of African food and I guess you know with them being my siblings and like hearing about stuff over there like it's kind of a big deal to eat everything, and then also like, like the way that I eat chicken is, <laughs> is like, there's nothing left on it, and mm-hmm. you know we even eat Pick the marrow the of yeah, the bone. Yeah, that's good. Then. So yeah, or oh, like make yeah, stock out of it, boil it, it up, and, and then make some stock or something. You know? Yeah. No, we just go ahead and just eat it all out of there. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's hardcore. Yeah. It. Yeah. Um. So. It, it wasn't until I got to college that I probably left some food on my plate for the first time at the cafeteria, and I was like, I felt weird about it, and 
I was like, I guess this is okay. Like, I'm not hungry mm. enough to finish this, but like, this is weird, <laughs> you know, just to, to get food and then not eat well, it. Well, just because it was so. like really frowned upon in your household. Yeah, mm. basically. And also, if you didn't eat fast in my house, like, you aren't getting seconds. So we were just a bunch of little greedy gobblers. <laughs> well, I guess your siblings um. were just eating all the food and then you were just being left sad and hungry, so... Yeah, so you better get in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So, like, um, growing up in Kentucky, I mean, apart from the fact you know you had like nine siblings and all this stuff, so like, what was what was your life like like growing up? Um, like, where in Kentucky were you born? Like, what was it like? What are your earliest memories? Things like that. Oh wow. Um, well, I was born in Lexington, which is the horse capital of the world. Ah, um, oh, like Kentucky Derby. And then, yeah, that- and I've never been to the Derby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we're big. But, it's a very big horse racing. We're a big horse racing nation ourselves, like in the UK. Oh, yeah. So it's like I know, like my old man, for example, like loves horse racing. So I've, I will hear about mm-hmm. the Kentucky Derby. I'm not really interested in horse racing, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I love horses, and we grew up. Um, I was homeschooled, so part That's of cool. my fondest memories were like we. My mom would find us stuff to do outside of normal schooling that was still educational and like skills developing and that kind of thing so we would go to a nearby town that had a farm that had horses and we would like we learned how to you know clean them and clean their hooves and like brush them and saddle them and then take them on little rides and stuff like that um maybe like a couple of times a week or something and um so that was a good skill and then like there was some beekeeping stuff we did we would go out to like learn learn about different cultures like there's the shaker community what's the Um, shaker community they i don't know if there's anybody left because you're not allowed to marry outside of it or something so that leads Um, to complications down the line (laughs) yes yes exactly but they are basically like they they're kind of like quakers okay but they're the shaker community they're like quakers but they're shakers (laughs) yeah they they had their own like beliefs religiously and so is it like a branch of christianity sort of thing the same as like quakerism or mormonism maybe yeah like kind of culty but like (laughs) but in a nice you know not in a bad way i guess and you know they had their own little community where because i don't think they had outsiders do anything so like they were big into herding sheep and like homestead in lifestyle and yeah so there's some of those communities around kentucky that we would go visit and learn about and then like just different things like that there we have forts um you know from early america battles and things so we would go learn you know history and different things and so it's fun because we did a lot of field trip type of stuff um and hiking was part of that we'd go hiking but before we went hiking we had to like read all about okay there's going to be limestone and then there's a spring here and we we would drink out of the spring and man i'm jealous you know, of your upbringing like brother. it was really it cool. sounds yeah. amazing it was mm. <laughs> it was cool and we we were definitely not a unschooling homeschool family because yeah. there are some homeschool families that don't actually do any like literature or yeah. or math or anything and we definitely did all of that and um I mean, I was kind of lazy in high school, but I uh, still graduated knowing a lot of... I, I think I knew mostly history and writing mm. in a very excellent like level. And then in college, I caught up on math a little bit and then ended up being... Yeah, but who likes maths? Apart stuff? from like autistic people, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. My old man's an accountant. Exactly. You know, he's, you know, but I mean, that's just... Yeah. But I can tell you right now, he's, like, he's autistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love, I love that math works. Yeah. Or doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And that was, I was in biology before I was in chemistry. And biology had zero answers. Like, it was just, it could be anything, but it's maybe not even what the teacher's looking for. And that was really frustrating mm. because I would like, I'd write out some, you know, long essay answer, and then they're like, "This isn't what we wanted," and it's like okay, well, in chemistry, there's a formula, and if you don't know it, then you're screwed, and if you know it, then you're 
you know that you walked out of that test with an A, you know? So it's like, it's very like black and white. It's a bit more nuanced. I liked that because I was like, okay, I like to know what's going mm. on. I don't want to be clueless and then just miss the mark, you know, completely sure. all the time. So I changed my major and, you know, here we are. I wanted to be a dentist, but I stopped because um, I got tired of school. So it's very, I mean, I, I got more interested in music. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's the same in the US. In the UK, it's, it's uh, very hard to become a dentist. You have to study for a long time. I think I've heard that you have to study yeah. longer than you have to be to be a lot of other type of doctors, you know, like a lot of. Yeah, I mean, you should be able to do it in four more years yeah. after college. But, you know, it's still then you have to, you know, either open a practice or join in. And then you, the dental school, you know, debt is like you're paying that off for like 30 years. And then it's a lot of debt. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of commitment yeah. to do that because if, if you're going to do that, like you don't want to become a dentist and then just go work some other job that's ne- not going to ever cover those debts. So you you basically have to be a dentist and then you'll start making money in about 40 years. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know? People think dentists are like the wealthiest people and it's like, well, they're paying off a lot of debt first and then – then and when then like when you're like 50 money. years old or 60 then you make some money yeah, <laughs> yeah. when you're 50 you start to get some savings going yeah, yeah. so you so say you're so, you're you're a chemist now so like um what's your sort of day-to-day job like 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 do you know what I mean so when you're at work what are you doing well um let's see the first year out of school I worked at a healthcare lab that was running like quality analysis methods all day and I was cool but boring for me and um so then i got this opportunity through a family friend to work for a cannabis company here in tennessee <laughs> <laughs> and uh so nice basically i've done that for like five and a half years now and and i do everything from like extractions to formulation to developing new products you know what sort of products, what sort of products? <laughs> um, all the ones that are legal here. <laughs> no, yeah, no, yeah, sure. I'm just which interested. Include pretty much a lot. Yeah. Um, so CBD, CBG, CBN. What's CBG? There's CBG is awesome. So it's it's the mother cannabinoid um, of both hemp and marijuana, mm. and so like it's not psychoactive in of itself, but it's very medicinal. It's very helpful for people with like. Um, autoimmune conditions and it's it's like cellular regulation so it's very anti-cancer like fighting cancer type of a cannabinoid and it also promotes brain activity so it's really great for people with like parkinson's or even like an epileptic um condition um just to kind of like i've I've seen videos of people with like having seizures and stuff and um i can't remember yeah. exactly what they were given because the thing is I've, i mean you can get cbd in the uk um like uh, mm-hmm. cannabis like to smoke isn't legal like it's but it's yeah. one of those things like like pr- like more than 50 percent of mm-hmm. like like kids do it at some stage or another and and like still yeah. more yeah. a lot of adults do it i but, think it's been passed medicinally now as well has like, it? But yeah p- yeah you can get um p- prescribed uh, uh, th- yeah th- there's a there's a certain nice. yeah where you can kind of with, with the doctors and stuff in the uk really? now I yeah, didn't, yeah i yeah, didn't yeah. know that mate but, yeah. you, but you can go in like shops yeah. you can go in like shop you can go in like you know like a uh, say you know any sort of like health you know, a supplement store or anything like that. You know, you can go in there and know you can buy like CBD, but I'd never heard of like CBG. And did you say there was another one as yeah. well, like CBE? Did you say CBN? Oh, CBN. Well, so what's There's that? CBN. That one is a, a naturally sedative, uh, sedating cannabinoid. Okay. So it's it's like people that have insomnia, things like that. Sleep sleep formulas, yeah. Um, and it's also not psychoactive. Um, Drew's, I could see Drew's type, and I think he's looking it, up to buy some of this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder if, like, the CBD that y'all have, if it's in an isolate form, it's not as effective. So, like, one of the things that my company, it's not my company, but the company that I work sure. for, we push for full spectrum products, and that means that there is some THC present, but that it's what's it's the amount that's naturally occurring in the hemp plant and 
those are all supposed to be there to work together sure. mm. for the plant to bind to you. You're natural. The plant, plant's natural. So all of those receptors get more fulfilled if everything's present that was in the plant. And, of course, you have to bring that THC level down to a certain percentage. But, like, that's a huge thing. It's like a lot of people are like, oh, CBD doesn't work for me. And I'm like, well, have you had a full spectrum? Yeah. Because, like, if it's just an isolate, then you're only getting CBD, mm. which is anti-inflammatory in nature, but it's not all of the things mm. that the plant could provide, you know, for you. So. Yeah, I've heard that a lot of um, CBD that you can just buy off the shelf is uh, not that effective. But like, yeah, but because of the fact that it's not the highest quality, I used to buy mm -hmm. CBD like a while back. Um, it's, I mean, A, it's extremely expensive. Um, in the UK anyway, very, very expensive mm. for like a little bottle, like very expensive. So um, unless you're wow. like a baller, it's, it's not, probably like <laughs> weighing up options unless you're like really unfit, which I'm not like, it's probably not necessary. It's probably better to save your money. And then, yeah, I did also hear mm -hmm. that the stuff that you can get off most shelves, say in the UK is, is not, is not great. So that's awesome that like, you know, but it's like anything in life. It's like anything, there's like such a variation of quality, like in anything. Oh, yeah, it, you know? yeah. And also, like, it's not, it's just not effective at, at low dosages. Mm. Like, so you have to have it kind of packed to, it, for, like, the non-psychoactive compounds, mm. they need to be a higher dosage. Mm. So, like, you know, where you might be able to have a cerebral experience with 5 milligrams of THC, but 5 milligrams of CBD is not really going to do anything. Like, mm. an adult usually needs, like, 80 or higher okay. in one dose to, like do whatever it is that they're trying to get it to do so yeah i'd like to like um like later on maybe like tomorrow or something i'd like to message you more about like the company you work for and that and get some more details because i mean it might cost yeah. like an arm and a leg to like import it over to the uk because it really depends like some stuff you order from the states oh, yeah. like it, it's not very expensive There's and other all stuff kinds of laws about that too mm. yeah, yeah i mean i don't know but like for the <laughs> cbd i can't imagine it would be because like cbd as i said you can buy it off the shelves like in the uk so i mean i don't know i mean yeah but if it's full spectrum i don't know if that's I'll have to look into that, yeah. but I know that a lot of other countries have a clause on that 0.3% of THC okay. that's mm. present here, that's legal sure. here. So I can't wait till it's all legal. Yeah, I think, gonna it, I think it is going to uh, go that way yeah. eventually. Mm. I don't think mm. it's, is it, like, how many, yeah. how many U.S. states um, is it legal in now? Is it like m the majority of them or is it still? It's not the majority yet, um, but they're slowly like... Going around. We, I mostly have been keeping lifestyle. track of like the southern states, but yeah, like um, slowly and surely, I th we just need it to happen. Yeah, you know, nationally, <laughs> that that would be the best yeah. instead of like state by state. Yeah, but, sure. Because it's so frustrating to try to keep up with like, oh, now they've gone medical and then the, they're they're recreational and then blah 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 and then oh, but well, you can't go through this state mm. at all, you know? It's like. Okay, can we just get on the same page here? Well, yeah, and it's a bit it's a bit like what I was saying about like the UK and I'm sure like let's face it it'll be the same in all those states where it's uh, still illegal like like so many people do it anyway. It's like well if you're doing it um mm -hmm. through like I mean it sounds like a dramatic term, but if you're doing it through the black market, um like mm -hmm. you you could be fund funding some like really bad stuff. Whereas if you're buying it yeah. legit and and uh you know the government and everything are, are, are like helping you well, you know, just doing it legitimately, then you know you're not funding anything like, you know, well, all the bad things that you know that could be doing. Like, it could be freaking illegal slave trade. It could be freaking illegal firearms. It could be anything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. Like, I don't think, like, s some governmental authorities realize it's like, you can get tax on this, you can <laughs> make jobs with this, and... Case it's in point, Brenna McMillan, chemist at large. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's safer for consumption because you have tests and regulations that have gone, you know, that yeah. these products have gone through. So, like, you know, we test all of our stuff for molds and pesticides and all of this stuff. And it's like, if somebody's growing it in their closet, you don't know that it's not moldy in there. Mm. Like, yeah, who wants to be you smoking know, what mold? What are you inhaling? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I'm such a prude when it comes to, like, other... I'm like, but where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, but that's good. <laughs> you know, because I'm like, I want the clean stuff, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, but that's that's good though. That just shows. Um, I think it's good to like have standards. You know, it's like yeah. a steak. You don't yeah. want to be eating any steak. You want to make sure you're eating a good steak. Grass fed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Yeah, that's it. Pasture, that's it. Pasture, pasture raised. free or whatever. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's. I have to say, that's a freaking awesome day job you've got. It just sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I jealous. Oh yeah. <laughs> definitely jealous. <laughs> Bruce's been to like yeah, Peru it, and it, done loads of cra- nice. lo- done loads of crazy psychedelics and all things. So, nice. Yeah, nice. <laughs> we should have sovereignty <laughs> over our own consciousness, as Graham Hancock would say. Don't don't get him, don't get him started, <laughs> Brenna. Don't get him started. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's so cool that you literally just like sit in a lab, like thinking about like um, essentially doing like R and D on on just like trying to come up with new products and things like that. It sounds like a pretty fun yeah. fun way to live. So. It has. Been, I yeah. know you said obviously you know you wanted to like um, push this back just a little bit today. So were you just like just packing up loads of like CBD products and stuff like that? And oh yeah, we've been moving stuff and like just kind of reorganizing and just moving our warehouse location mm. too. So it's it's been a lot on my body. So that's a lot of four twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of 420 and after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you finally finish, you're like, oh, thank God for that. Yeah. I thought it was kind of cool int- uh, yeah. earlier on. I'm, I'm really into my history, and you said that you were really into history in school. Um, what sort of history were you into? Mm-hmm. Was it more just sort of like American history or? Yeah, I don't know that I was into I wasn't really into learning okay. in general. I never have been. Okay. And I wish that I was more as a kid, but I liked reading a lot as a kid but I I just as far as absorbing information that I have to be super interested in it but we definitely learned Mm. a lot of Kentucky history and American history especially after we adopted Mm. to kind of like introduce my siblings to American culture and stuff Um, and then some world history as well but I I don't know how much I remember because I don't absorb Mm. stuff if I don't care about it yeah that's fair enough so. it's making me intrigued it's making me intrigued about like specific kentucky history though because i mean i don't know how much i know about it can you think of i don't want to put oh, you on yeah. the spot is there like anything you can think of in particular that would be like interesting kentucky history yeah i mean i think that well we have a strong history with like tobacco industry mm. and mining industry um which Eastern Kentucky has the Eastern Coal Fields region, and so there's um, just tons and tons of mining communities, and it's that's very intriguing to me because, like, you know, my family history doesn't go back far in Kentucky because my mom's from Texas and my dad's from Ohio, but so they met in Texas and they moved up there for my dad to go to school, and I just happened to be born there. Okay, but um, but the Eastern Kentucky like history is like a dark and mysterious thing um, because it's all these, you know, kind of poverty-stricken communities that have been generations and generations of miners. And basically there there's less high education over there, and so you're basically stuck working in the mines for mm. forever um, unless you just leave and try to make it out in a big city on your own. And if no one else in your family has done that, it's pretty daunting. Yeah, sure. Um, but a lot of good music has come out of that because, you know, if you're in the mine all day and then you come home, maybe you're going to sit on your porch and play a little fiddle or, or write something. And so there's a lot of sad mining ballads. Man, um, I'm going to have to check some of these there's a lot sad of, mining Kentucky oh, yeah. ballads out. Yes, there's a lot of like this like heart. I don't know. It's there's a few song collectors that I met in college, and they would go out to Eastern Kentucky and interview people and and collect songs. Mm. Um, and it's like this huge thing out there, and these people are like such a tight knit community, and they know immediately if you're from out of town, like because. You just wouldn't be there otherwise, you know. And um, so it's it's a very interesting place, but it, I say it's like dark and mysterious because there's there's also what else are you gonna do? There's a lot of drugs, mm. um, so there's a lot of meth and you know heroin and things like that out there, and it's harder to have the law go into these places because these people are so rural and like mistrusting of authority and stuff um so it's you know not everything's like that and i don't want to paint like a yeah sure 
distasteful picture of Eastern Kentucky at all. I just think it's very intriguing, and there's a lot of cool, sad, interesting history there. Um, But it's like for music. It's like you were saying though, like you know, with all that sadness and stuff, like that's often where beauty comes. You know, so you're saying all those ballads and stuff that come that came out of the any bleakness or sadness that was going on there. So it swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's where like the word lonesome. Like, you'll see, hear bluegrass mm. songs or singers um, described as lonesome, and that's, like, the best description because it's, like, this harrowing cry coming through, mm. you know, that's, like, this is generations deep here, you know, mm. like, that this, you know, this expression is coming from. Um, and I love that. You know, I I learned banjo from a guy from eastern Kentucky that had moved to the county I grew up in and he was pretty you know pretty eastern Kentuckian yeah, sure. <laughs> and you know he chain smoked cigarettes the whole time that he's teaching me and stuff much to my mother's chagrin but um, was that like did I you think, ask for banjo lessons or like how did that arrangement no. come about <laughs> no it was more like my brother Theo was already playing a few instruments and this was before we adopted. I was nine. And then, uh, my pappy from Texas sent us a, you know, cheap open back banjo. And he was like, well, if you guys live up there in Kentucky, you're going to have to play some bluegrass music. And he knew we were all music. I love how serious he was, but um, he's like, no, you're going to have to, there's no <laughs> freaking choice. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I love and that. so basically, cause Theo was already playing like four or five instruments at the time or something like, it was on me, I guess, to play banjo, and mm-hmm. I was not happy about it. <laughs> As I said, I was lazy, and I didn't like to learn stuff. I like to do what I wanted to do. So I thought it was really stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first lesson, especially because I only learned the roles, um, and to me, that was like not music. It was just sounds, mm. and which music is just a compilation of sounds but I know what you mean, as though. a nine-year-old I was like this is dumb I'm just playing these stupid patterns and I hate it and then the second lesson I think I learned a song and I was like oh I think I might like this so um I liked it but kind of secretly <laughs> I just exhibited that I still hated just it being for stubborn. a while just being st- yeah oh the most stubborn yeah. yes <laughs> how old were you do you reckon when, when so, that started when you started getting your banjo lessons uh Nine. You're nine. Yeah. And was, was is Theo mm-hmm. older than you? Yeah, he's two years older. So he so. was already like learning stuff, becoming this like. Yeah, he was playing fiddle, violin, and fiddle already, and then he had all he'd been playing piano since he was like three, and he was getting into guitar at the time, and he could play harmonica, and like he was just he's very musical, mm. um, and I was like, well, he's doing that. Why do I have to do that? You know, mm. but um, then then I liked it because nobody else played the banjo. So I was special. Yeah. And then <laughs> if you need a banjo, I like, train, oh, well, I, here's your gal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Although it wasn't cool. Um, like none of my friends played. So it was just jamming with old guys if there was any jamming to be had. And so I was kind of. I was still kind of like, this isn't really cool. Like, yeah, but I think it is know, cool. It, it is cool. It's just that, um, like, the people of your age range didn't appreciate it. Like, I mean, I even find that yeah. with like folk music. Like, there's not to be honest. Like, I'm a massive like folk music fan. There's like an even like mm-hmm. I'm not like a spring chicken. I'm 34 years old. You know, like I mean, I know it's all mm-hmm. relative, but like it's just <laughs> growing up when we were in school and stuff. It was like rock music uh you know like metal yeah. music you know i guess that whole like new metal scene was going on and obviously you know Brit- there's always been a lot of music in the british scene obviously britain's like known for its music scene do you know what i mean but it was like i got into folk music because uh my my mum would like play like bands like clan i don't know if you heard that's like an irish folk band called clan ad when i was younger and stuff mm-hmm. and then she also likes like americana and you know like some some american like folk stuff and so it, like i got more into just like naturally progressed into like kind of British folk music and stuff like that. But see, like even at the age I'm at now, like I've shown a lot of it to like Drew and I think Drew probably has an appreciation mm. for it now, like much more than he say, cause he probably just wouldn't have got into it if I didn't like show him it so much. And I probably another couple of other people are the same, but 
um yeah i guess it's seen more as like an older person's thing isn't it you know it's like yeah yeah it was definitely like it wasn't cool but it was actually cooler and that's why the kids didn't think it was cool <laughs> because it was more i guess yeah, it had more I that than maybe whatever was popular at the time it, it was something that was going to last me a, a much longer time um and it gives you value and it's life, unique because you know? if you're the only person doing that of your yeah. age range then you know yeah it's much yeah. better and be it was, than be like everyone else yeah exactly and i mean i ended up you know enjoying joining like 4-h contests or you know like little contests here and there and playing banjo really fast and people were like whoa and i thought that was cool you know so it it ended up being fun i probably played a lot less in high school just because like we adopted when i was 11 and so the high school years were kind of focused on family and siblings and everything um and less on like music stuff but in college i picked it back up again when i joined the college band and then i was like this is awesome so yeah i have to say like it is super cool though when i like i mean i've I've watched so many videos of you now just like scrolling through your instagram and like you know i know you haven't got much on your on your youtube but the couple of things that you have got on your youtube (laughs) it is freaking cool like watching you um play because i mean don't get me wrong like i guess obviously you can like buy banjos in the uk and it's like you know i'm sure like and because it's a string instrument, you know what it's like. It's like a lot of people that play guitar will then buy a banjo because it's fun and then maybe learn how to play a bit of banjo yeah. and stuff. But obviously, banjo is like an American instrument. It might be one of the only American instruments, if you know what I mean. Like, Yeah, well, it actually originated in Africa, which is cool for right. me because, you know, I have a bunch of siblings from Do there. No, I didn't and, know that. But I thought yeah, the banjo it, was like it, created in the US. Well, this five string version yeah. yes but there was there were you know instruments that it like evolved out of different countries in africa they brought over you know unfortunately with slavery but like it was you know a common sound you would hear is like ballads and banjo and fiddle stuff yeah. going on um in those communities and so it developed from there into what it is now, you know, mainly because of Earl Scruggs, you know, he came up with, because there, there's claw hammer, you know, and that's more the early America, like, and, and it was also with like Irish, you know, bluegrass is kind of this mix of like the African, whatever version of the banjo that it was at that time. It might have been like a gourd thing mm. and it's probably frailed. And then, you know, all the Irish people have had these long time old ballads mm. and stories that they brought. Yeah. And so it's kind of the combination because you had the the Irish were a lot of indentured servants. And so they they were in kind of similar quarters with slaves at times. And even after, you know, the Civil War and everything, there was this other class of people that ended up making this amazing folk music and that's probably part of why it has like such a deep like lonesome feeling because you know it's coming from people who have left everything behind and they're here yeah and you know they want to tell stories from home with the music and you know it just kind of continued on and then it became you know we're a melting pot so then it became american music yeah basically it's um, very and so earl scruggs kind of he started picking on it first so one thing i find really interesting because um i mean i guess predominantly uh i i definitely know a lot more about like uk folk music and um and as you mm-hmm. um as you sort of like alluded to like there's a lot of a lot of folk music it's one of the reasons why i love it like a lot of the tracks are like hundreds and hundreds of years old like there's there's like folk tracks mm-hmm. that are like a lot older than the united states yeah and nobody oh, yeah. nobody knows who wrote them they're just sort of were just passed down by sort of bard to bard um and then eventually made their way to the states but what i find really interesting for example there's a very old like um well-known uh, folk song in the uk called like raggle taggle gypsies and um i can't remember it was a really famous country artist i can't remember who i was listening to a couple of, a couple of years ago and 
it was exactly the same um like melody but mm. played instead of played on um maybe like a mandolin it was played on a banjo and the lyrics were yeah. changed to reflect i guess more like cowboy lifestyle in the u.s so it was less about like yeah the raggle taggle gypsy which, which would have been very much about like life in the uk um, at that time mm-hmm. it was very much like um dueling and this raggle taggle gypsy stole this lord's like uh like wife who didn't want to marry this lord so then they had a duel yeah. and stuff and it, but it'd like been changed more to this like cowboy story but it was exactly the same <laughs> tune and i was like it, i found it cool in my head that i imagined that some folk musician that went over to america like hundreds of years ago played that raggle tiger gypsies i mean and then yeah. that became because it was no longer relevant to their life the lyrics evolved and then rather than playing it on a mandolin they were playing it on a banjo and then it became this whole new song but the melody is exactly the same i just thought that was freaking awesome just almost like from a history point oh of view. yeah so cool yes i think that's like one of the coolest aspects of songwriting and and in this kind of genre of music that i'm in because yeah there's this song like called Omi Wise, um, and it's a murder ballad, and uh, I think Bob Dylan wrote a song about this ballad, maybe, Um, and then there's several different versions, though, of this same story Mm. of, like, this guy that, you know, got a girl pregnant and then killed her or something, and so as everybody used to do. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically, like, I think it goes all the way back, like, hundreds of years to Ireland, and there's, like, this Irish version of it, mm. and there's, like, a million verses, mm. and it's it's just so detailed, and it, it clearly was a story that came over here and then got developed and changed and, you know, was being told in different ways, and then, like, it ended up, it's made its way into several different people's songs and stuff and I, I just think that's so cool really cool um just keeping history alive and like also like some people get freaked out by murder ballads but i think it's if it especially if it's an old one it's like this was just how someone was able to remember yeah. this story to tell people to to warn them of you know bad men or whatever you know like, yeah like it's stories it's like a lot like of people a, back in the day couldn't read and write and stuff that you need to get the message yeah, down so somehow that's telling a story i mean i mean yeah. I, we had um we had a quite a prolific uk folk musician called damn the bard on and he's it's pretty cool actually he's like what's known as like the pen dragon of the order of bards of eights and druids in the uk so he's a pretty yeah. cool guy but um um oh do you know what i'm having a brain fart what was i gonna say what were you just saying brenna sorry uh murder ballads yes no no he was just basically saying about how the importance it's like almost like people don't i guess maybe take musicians as seriously seriously as they used to back in the day but like bards were like hugely important because not only was the the only time you could listen to music would be if you had a bard like musician present because obviously before we had electricity Mm -hmm. and gramophones and stuff like that there was no way to listen to it unless there was a musician present right but also because people often couldn't read and write it was a way of teaching people morals or teaching people like yeah about dangers and stuff like that it's like lessons yeah like a story stories lessons to people so like a moral of the story type of thing yes yeah and to be fair yeah i think there was no you go on there was more storytellers too. Yeah. There was musicians and storytelling was a huge thing. Like, you know, maybe, I don't know if it was hand in hand with music, but I don't know. in like, in like the middle East and stuff, they would have storytellers at the bazaar, you mm. know, and, and different things like, and those were also stories that it was just like, if you are a storyteller that had all these stories memorized, then you win. You know? mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's really cool. It's super cool. And I think it's one of my favorite things about like folk music is that like, you know, I mean, I love all sorts of types of music. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, and it certainly doesn't have to be like this, but I like, one of the things I like about folk music is that it is telling me like a story because it's like, well, who doesn't like a good story? Whether it's like watching a movie yeah. or reading a book or anything, it's like, you know, you're hearing a good story, but then it's with the music element of it and you're combining that. To me, that's like a really nice way to spend a couple of minutes Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah yeah absolutely yeah you know who who's really good at writing story songs is brennan lee um she's a great friend of mine and she's just also kind she's in the 
Nashville, Austin, Texas hybrid of like outlaw country slash Western country because she's from like North Dakota, I think. And she's just got a real gift for telling a story in a way that you're like the whole song. You're like, whoa, whoa. that's amazing. Like it's it's so cool. And I, I think that's a specific art in itself to be able to like tell a story like that. Yeah, I'll have to check her out. Do you say her name's Brenna Lee? Brennan Lee. Brennan Lee, right. So we get mistaken a lot with the Brenna Brennan yeah, sure. thing, but it's B-R-E-N-N-E-N. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So. But, like, you know, just um, sort of just made me think of it because you mentioned um, Bob Dylan. To be fair to, like, Bob Dylan and also um, Joan Baez, like, they were really mm -hmm. good at... Um, they played a lot of, like, old European, like, well, UK sort of oh, British yeah. uh, uh, folk songs and stuff. I remember, and it's funny because, I mean, I'm... I'm freaking like I know a hell of a lot about UK folk music and, and the history and origins of, of the songs and stuff but um, do you know that song House Carpenter um, anyway Joan Baez oh, yeah. did a fantastic cover of House Carpenter and I listened to it hers was the first version I heard so I thought it was her song at first and then I looked into it and I was like mm. oh no it's like this really old song and I looked into it and I think it was first the first uh, like written down knowledge of it was from like a I think in like a newspaper in Portsmouth which is like a it's like a seafaring town on like the very sort of like south coast of, of the UK. Um, and it was originally called The Demon Lover. And that's moral of the story. It's all about this woman who um, she has like a very good life with her carpenter husband. And um, but this guy comes and it's an ex lover of hers. And he basically he's like got, he is dressed very fancy. And he says, like, look, I've got all these ships um, and I've got all these like yeah. riches and stuff like come come away and live with me. And at first she's like, no, I've, I've got my house carpenter husband. I'm. I've got my like child, my little baby and stuff. Um, like, and he basically, he ends up seducing her away. And then when she's on the voyage on these ships to go away, um, like the, the skies go dark and the ship starts to sink and she's like, what's going on? And it turns out that her lover was the devil and he's oh. taking her to like hell, like wow. in, in quite like a, um, like a poetic way, you know, I guess it's like the depths of hell, like the, the ocean in this yeah. story is like symbolizing that. But it's basically the, I guess the moral of the story is, is like, don't always think the grass is greener on the other side. And right. like, don't yeah. um, like betray the people. Like she had a very good thing with her. She had a husband that loved her. She had a baby, you know, all this good stuff. She was fine. But because she was she seduced by the riches, the riches and everything. And, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I think cool. I love that. But yeah, Joan Bess did a great, yeah. great version of that house carpenter. And then I found out, as I said, it was like this like freaking 450 year old like British song. I was like, that's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. It was probably like some fable that they would tell the young women like be careful now you know i mean i do I, mean, I do sing this uh i think it's probably pretty old it's called fair and tender ladies and it's it's a warning about the young men that they'll you know they'll court you and then they'll leave you basically yeah. and you gotta be um, look out for them i'm pretty sure it's, ladies yeah it's like an old <laughs> warning song yeah yeah yeah, and that's cool. I'll have to check that out. What did you say it's called? Fair and Tender Ladies. Fair and, and Tender Ladies. Uh, yeah, I'd look up the Osborne Brothers version of it. I think it's okay. beautiful. Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. No, I'm, uh, any like, re music recommendations I'm always up for because, I mean, oh, yeah. I think that's one of, the fav one of the best things about sort of my job is being in radio. It's just like listening to loads of new music all the time. New stuff, yeah. Yeah, and as I said, like even, you know, when I first like, found out about you and then I like instantly just try to find as much music as I could and then you just released that Black Bear song or I think you maybe did oh, actually yeah. just after maybe I first heard about you because it was very recent, wasn't it? You brought out Black Bear. Yeah, I or maybe I posted that at like the end of January or something. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'd already known about you for for a few weeks or something like that. And then, um, yeah, I remember. What I usually do is I'll just basically look every everywhere I can possibly find music. I'll try and search an artist. So like YouTube, I'll yeah. see what are those ports are cool. And then yeah, and then I was like, That's, this song kicks ass, man. Like freaking <laughs> loves that song. Yeah, I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. Listen to it. Um, do you mind me asking, just because I think it's like an intriguing story. So what's the deal with, um, like, your, was it like your mum and dad, like both like adopting like a load of um, like kids from oh, yeah. from Africa? Like, how did that come about? Um, well, let's see. I know that mom couldn't have any more kids naturally. And at the time, there was it was just you two and your brother? Just, just you two and biological three? brothers. Right. And then me. So... 
I was, I guess, begging for a sister. Um, and so, and they wanted to have more kids, I think. Um, and so they were kind of looking into adoption just to kind of maybe adopt one more girl or something. And then I don't know how it happened. It evolved from <laughs> looking for one girl to, um, we ended up seeing, I guess there was a magazine. It was kind of like a missions magazine that came to the house. My parents are strong Christians and I'm a Christian as well, but, um, it came to the house and they, I guess, felt captivated by it. There, there's a orphanage talked about in there that, you know, Liberia, the country that my siblings are from, had a 15 year civil war and left the country pretty decimated. And the average age was 18. Um, after the war, and so basically there was no one to run the country, there's just, you know, basically no one in charge, and tons of orphanages full of kids, and so um, they just felt very called to, there's a scripture that says, take care of the widows and orphans, and they felt called to that, and um, so they started looking at this one orphanage, and saw a little boy first, and just felt like he was you know, belonged in their hearts, and so then, um, basically that turned into my first four siblings coming over, so we went from three kids to seven kids one year, um, and then in the next two years after that, there were a few families in the area that had adopted from the same orphanage, and this, this is a warning <laughs> for people who are want to adopt. It's like, make sure that you and your spouse are on the same page and that you think about this. Like, mm. this is people you're dealing with. Like, this is not adopting a dog from a shelter, which mm. people make a big deal out of that sure. as well. And it's like, these are kids with real feelings and lives. And, like, I guess, you know, a few of the people that had adopted from this or orphanage were it changed their minds basically and they called my parents and they were like well our kids know your kids so do you want to take them or we'll just send them back to africa and That's it's mad. like That's mad. it's horrible and yeah, it's crazy. so basically my parents you know had had huge hearts and they you know took on a lot but basically ended up adopting four more kids wow. from these disrupted adoptions and so yeah, it basically just kind of evolved. So within, I think, three years, we grew from a family of five to a family of 14. That's crazy. Um, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. What was it like so, for you? What was it like for you? Like, Because uh, it must have been <laughs> quite a, like a, a shock in some ways. Like, It was definitely a, a culture shock. Like, you know, my parents wanted us to speak good English and help them assimilate to American culture, but it's quite the opposite effect when you have so many people mm. from that culture. And all my siblings were from 8 to 16 when they were adopted, so, right. like, they had plenty of culture to bring. They weren't babies, you know. Yeah, and how old were you and at the time? I was 11. Yeah. Um, and so very Still impressionable, impressionable. age. Yeah. Yes, and so, like, I have two older sisters and two younger sisters, so I was very immersed in, you know, even stuff like skincare and hair care, I was, I was, I always joke, I don't know how to do my hair now, like, because I only know how to do braids and, <laughs> like, extensions and weaves, and I only know how to do that, like, I, so with my hair growing up, my mom was, like, one day, she's like, why is your hair so greasy, and I was like, well, because I've, you know, greased each row, and everything and she's like you don't need to do that <laughs> she was like, that's, that's, so not, funny. that's not your hair texture it's different like yeah. you don't have the same you know things so like i know all these brands like african hair product brands and so like it's so funny because i just have a totally different experience with my hair care mm. and and skin care you know like I was shocked. One of my white friends was like, I don't put lotion on my legs after I shave them or whatever. And I was like, horror upon horrors. Like, you need to be not only, like, <laughs> using, like, coconut oil and cocoa butter all the time, but, like, you know, how could you even let that happen? Like, <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it was different 
culture for me. And then we spoke Liberian English, you know, growing up, which is so. What's Liberian English? Different. It's different. <laughs> um, Liberia was settled actually by um, people that came to America as slaves and then were freed and then okay. they went back. So Monrovia was named after James Monroe, the president at the time, and um, that's the capital of Liberia. And so there's a lot of like early America British actually influence in mm. the speaking. Um, so it's kind of like a mix between old English, which I would say is very British mm -hmm. um, accent and kind of like word choices like vexing. Um, okay. is a common term. That's a I great guess, word, though. It's one example. Oh, yeah. Why would you say word. I'm like, I'm unhappy rather than I'm vexed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, or like provoking, like different things yeah. that that were said in early America. Plus, probably, I don't remember how many tribes there are, but like maybe 12 plus tribes that, you know, are in Liberia. So you have all these different bush languages, um, which are totally tribal languages. That's so you cool. have that mix mixed with the British vibes from the city. Um, people who basically, I think the people who came back from America probably settled more in the cities. And then you have all the tribal people that were mm. native to there from the get go. So there's just a huge mix of tribal languages and this British um, phrasing and stuff. So it's, it's a very unique sounding language with basically in it would be considered to be pretty bad grammar mm. um it's kind of like all mixed up and then um with different accents going on and and different tribal phrases thrown in there and different old phrases thrown in there so it, it's just kind of like a you'd call it pigeon english maybe um but it's it's a huge mix of of languages. Do you do of. you do you remember like thinking um, when uh, you know shortly after they were adopted and you were like hearing this for the first time? Do you remember thinking like, oh, that's like strange? Oh no, I I never thought it was strange because I was like a little kid. Um, and before my siblings came over, we started hanging out with this family um, from Louisville, Kentucky, that had adopted. Okay. From that same orphanage, and so like I was already hearing it, and I could understand the kids better than like adults because I was oh. a kid, you know. Yeah. So like, a lot of times I loved it because we would all speak Liberian English really fast, you know, and then maybe the adults <laughs> didn't understand what we were saying, and that was great. Yeah, I was like, code. Yay, it's like, it's my like, own language. Yeah, it's like your yeah. own little code and everything. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. Did they like tell you? Um, like, you know, or maybe, like, even to this day, um, ever told you, like, what it was like growing up in, like, Liberia? Like, what was it like for them? And was it, like, a culture shock going from that to the to Kentucky? I can imagine it was a completely different way of life. Yes. Uh, I think most of my siblings were in the orphanage for a long time um, because, like, a lot of families would bring their kids to the orphanage either because of the war. They hmm. thought that they were safer at an orphanage. And then also in the hopes that they would be adopted to America to get a better chance at life. Because mm. Liberia um, just didn't have a lot going for it um, at that time, right after the war. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of hope for successful living. Um, so I think most of my siblings' stories are pretty rough, you know, and I heard a lot of them. But I think coming here, they, they all figured things out like you know we were homeschooled so they had a chance to you know learn at, as far as like education wise and just assimilation mm -hmm. like kind of within the confines of a family it was a little easier maybe. it sounds nice it's like safe and comforting yeah but you know? definitely not without a lot of hardships because you know coming from like such a traumatic background and then coming here adults in their lives weren't the best and so they didn't necessarily you know just gel with having parents all of a sudden um that were authority figures you know because 
you know, they haven't had the best experience with adults, you know, so far in their life that were, like, in the war and stuff. So, you know, I think it was very challenging um, for all of us <laughs> mm. um, at, at times because, you know, you just have such a – you're bringing a lot of trauma into a big pile and putting it together, and yeah. um, that doesn't necessarily – yield um gemstones and butterflies yeah and like it's like trials and tribulations i expect there was like a hell of a big process for them to like uh transition to this new way of life oh yeah yeah but i think for the most part you know all 12 of us are doing pretty good and um i think are you pretty close yeah yeah um i i probably stay in touch with like five or six of my siblings every year or so and then like or like on a regular basis per Mm. year and then every once in a while like we pretty much only all get together for like weddings and funerals because we live all over the place um everyone lives in america but in different states and Mm. has their own lives going on i've got 18 nieces and nephews already one more on the way and so you know i try to keep in touch with all the little kids and um yeah but i have like i'm closest with like my oldest sister and my youngest sister and then one of two of my brothers that i went to college with and you know just there's different little groups of us that Mm -hmm. stay in touch better you know Hmm. how did your parents even like manage to look after so many kids like do they have like a do they have a big property and like a big house no i don't know (laughs) <laughs> wow. so what was like it was um what was like even like the arrangement do you know what i mean like with like bedrooms and stuff like were there just people living beds. everywhere <laughs> yeah it was a lot of bunk beds um wow. so there we had a it was a four bedroom house so two bedrooms were like we'd switch this up us kids like every year or whatever but two bedrooms for maybe the girls and then there's one bedroom for the guys and then we'd switch that so this then one bedroom for the girls and the two bedrooms for the guys, like, every other year or something, because it's kind of fun to change things up, yeah. But, and then we only had one bathroom for us kids for a while, and then we got a half bath added, and that helped a little, but the shower situation was always tough. Yeah, um, I imagine. We would line up on the stairs, like, <laughs> in the mornings, <laughs> like, you place your towel like if you're at the top, then you're next. So like people would move each other's towels. That's old. Like, <laughs> oh, wow. That's, old too. That's why, what yeah. you imagine like it was like in like Victorian times in England. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, yeah. There was, it was hard for us to get places on time. That's for sure. Like and but you know, I tell you some what, perks. I tell you what though, your parents must be like really decent people to just take on so many people and just like make that work because i think well well you just proofs in the pudding from what you were saying like about some other some other of those families like you know um it's just hard i can imagine it's super hard to make that work yeah yeah i think that i mean i think that they they did the very best that they could and i think you know definitely god was involved in mm. the miracle that it was for all of us to make it through. I was going to I was going to ask you if you think like um like the faith like had like a big thing to do with it. All. Yeah, I mean, I think that like if I strongly believe in God and I think if if he wasn't helping in some way with all of that, I don't know how with with all of us with our own trauma and stuff, like I don't know if if we would have gotten to this point with if there wasn't someone else in charge mm. of it in a grand scheme of things, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't want to come across like, um, like rant, ranting too much or anything like that, but it's like one thing that does, does make me sad. I think a little bit is, um, I think like a religion, especially Christianity, I think like gets a, a bad rap nowadays. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's like increasingly in like, uh, the U S in Europe and the UK, it's like not, uh, as popular obviously as it once was um even like say mm-hmm. like in the difference between say ours and our well even from like my childhood like let alone like my grandparents time i'm sure it was like night and day then but there are so many th- good things i think um about religion about christianity and I, and there's so many th- like 
bad aspects of society I can see coming out of less religious households. You know, like yeah. in the US, yeah. in, in Britain and America, traditionally Christian nations. And where that's like not so much a thing anymore, you're seeing a lot more, whether it's fatherless homes, whether it's, um, I don't know, just couples super willy-nilly will divorce, uh, not taking fa- family roles as seriously, they're not as close-knit, not as supportive, mm-hmm. not, encur- not encouraging their kids maybe in the same way that they would have done. And yeah, I don't know. I just think, you know, there's a, I think people are so quick, to focus on any bad aspects of religion and Christianity yeah. rather than actually see how many, I mean, you know, your siblings, yourself and that you're a testament to, you know, you said, you know, if it wasn't for maybe your um, your family's faith and everything and, and, you know, like belief in God that maybe you wouldn't have even had the siblings that you had and everything and think about how massively yeah. positively that affected their lives and I'm sure your life in the long run as well even if you were having to put your towel yeah. like, way down on the banister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even though I had to wait hours in line for the shower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and like rush through my food to get a second helping. But yeah, yeah I, think, I think that was very well said because like, yes, every, every form of beliefs has people that are hypocritical within it mm-hmm. that misrepresent and there's extremists and everything that make it look horrible. Um, and at the end of the day, there's two things like, I think, A, it's, you're going to have people that are living a more moral life in general because Mm -hmm. they think there's a consequence. They believe there's a consequence for, for immorality. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a positive thing for a culture to believe in morality because, you know, they're, they're going to try to avoid doing bad things. Yeah, rather than just the know. attitude of, I'm going to get away with as much as I possibly can. Yeah. You know, exactly. and whatever benefits me, blah, 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 you know. Yeah, and then also just this world has so much, like, pain and sadness in it, and it's it's really hard sometimes. And if if you're able to, if everything is ripped out from under you and you have no people that you can trust and, and nothing else... If you believe in God, like you have him at least, yeah. you know, in those times. Hope. And it's, yeah, exactly. Like, and it, even if it's a placebo effect, you yeah. know, yeah. like it's, it's there and it's, it's, it's not to be understated to those people. Yeah. And it's like, that's really something that, you know, a lot of people lean on in when they don't have anybody else or anything else going on and, and it prevents, you know, basically probably suicide or you know other things just like like this the will to live will remain because you believe in something greater than just this world and all of the sad stuff that goes along with that sometimes you know yeah and as you said for me especially i know i've i've had times where i had nobody you know and at least i had god so yeah and i you know, and I think like the two two big sort of things, you know, of like what we're both saying. I think you know, number one is hope. You know, always mm-hmm. having hope, and also as you said, even if it's a placebo type thing, like um, you know, and this is definitely relevant. You know, I mean, I've got like a, a three year old daughter. She's going to be like four in um, just a few days. Um, called oh, Evie. Correct. Shout out Evie, <laughs> and um, thanks, and um. Yeah, like our our cat, our cat basically passed away like um, in Aww. September, and it was the first time you know the cat you know she'd had it been around her all her life, and like I mean it was devastating for all of us, you know. I mean I'm just like a soppy git, so it's like you know that cat was like yeah. <laughs> I mean he used to be my mum's cat, and then I'm, long story short, I ended up taking him with me to where I lived, and he was like. I always used to refer to him as my little brother because he was like my mum's cat originally. And we were just very yeah. tight. And I know it sounds like cheesy and contrived or whatever, but I saw no, him as like I one of my best friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I saw him as like one of my best friends and he was like one of my confidants and we'd spend a lot of time together late at night and things. And and uh, when he passed away, obviously it was like upsetting for all of us. But for my daughter, she had no really concept of death at the time. And to yeah. go from... And, you know, I made the decision, um, like my, my missus at the time, she originally didn't want um evie to see me bury scrags but i said i thought it was very important that she does because she needs to understand like grow up understanding you know um about life and death and rather than i think that people if you grow up understanding that 
that's better in the long run than almost like what are we gonna wait until she gets to like six or seven and then there's this like horrible realization and then by that age it's probably more damaging but yeah but also you know she was like trying to trying to explain to a three-year-old like where your pet has gone can be quite confusing because they're gonna you know if they see the body but they don't know they know that it's not like the same you know so i was saying like well it's gone to obviously talking to a three-year-old i'm like it's gone to kitty heaven she's like kitty heaven what's that so i'm like explaining and you know and i'm saying you know and also you know like uh so when i was growing up you know like uh grandma and grandpops they had uh like pets as well that would pass away and you know i'd have to bury them in the back garden for grandma and grandpops and scraggy's gone to be with all of them in kitty heaven she's like oh okay um and you know she's you can see i could see she was like piecing it together in her mind and she was like okay so one day are we gonna go there and be with him and i was like yeah we'll all go there together and we'll all be together and regardless of whether that's true or not like what do you want me to tell a three-year-old girl like if someone yeah. was like some ardent skeptic what am i going to say no like it's gone and we're all just going to go one day too like yeah. how freaking <laughs> depressing like my life daughter would just grow up depressed <laughs> do you know what i mean like yeah. no and do you know what i mean and it's like like, you know you mean everything dies and then that's <laughs> yeah do you know what i mean it's like <laughs> and it's like to see them again and it's like obviously like of course like i i hope that the what i told my daughter is true as well you know it's like yeah. as you as we were talking yeah. about it's like holding on to that hope and what's the harm in it you know there's no harm in yeah it. exactly like that's that's one thing it's like well it would be it gives me a lot more like encouragement to think that there's another life after this that's better Mm -hmm. you know and like it's also encouraging for me to live better if i think that there's another life after this that isn't better yeah that i could possibly go to have more yeah have more of a positive impact in life and almost like it's like it's like free motivation yeah exactly it's free motivation (laughs) but it's also you know like it's definitely like helpful too when when people are passing away or whatever you know but animals and people and just to to understand that everything's going to be okay in a sense like like there's actually a chance to see them again you know and and if that person died too young you know you hear stories of people passing away at young ages yeah. and you yeah. know of course you have friends pass away way too early and you're like man like this doesn't seem fair and everything it's like well maybe they're they're gonna be able to do something better in this you know afterlife that we have no idea about and and you can just kind of reason i know when my banjo teacher passed away um when i was 15 i I was very close with him and I didn't know if he was a Christian or not. And I grew up, of course, like very, um, (laughs) religiously Christian. And Mm. so I didn't, I was so concerned and I thought that he might've gone to hell because I didn't know if, you know, he was saved or not. And, you know, cause he didn't live like anybody that I assumed was a Christian lived, you know, smoking okay. cigarettes or whatever. I don't know. And so, <laughs> oh, the cigarette smoker. Yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> what a sin. But, you know, and he, he would cuss, too, and stuff like that. He was a little more, like, crass a bad than boy. the typical people that I was allowed to hang out with. Sure. And so, basically, my mom said to me, like, she was like, Brenna, you don't need to think about that. Like, God has way more grace than we can imagine and that brought so much comfort to my Mm. heart because i i realized like i couldn't i couldn't determine whether someone was going to be going to heaven or not and so then it wasn't even like my responsibility like i just have to leave that up to god it's between them and god and like then i don't have to be heartbroken if someone passed away and i didn't know Mm. what their standing was or something you know like it just took it out of my hands to not not to never talk to people and see what they think about god but like just to feel like okay like i don't have to worry about this because i'm not in charge of it and Mm. like i don't i can't even grasp or understand 
the person who is in charge of it, or not yeah. person, but the being. Yeah, you're who just is in, charge in charge of yourself. Of so you can only try yeah, and be exactly. the best version of you that you can be. Try and be like yeah. a good Samaritan. Try and be a decent human being, and that's yeah, the only thing that you have control over. Then experience much less grief, you know, if someone passes on without yeah, yeah. being like you know, hundred percent concerned about maybe I won't get to see them again, you know, or something. Mm. So I don't know. I think it's it's funny. I didn't ever talk this much about you know faith uh, about someone or with someone about music but it's yeah. funny how this came up <laughs> no no i mean i'm really enjoying talking to you about it so as long as you're happy talking about it yeah. then i think it's yeah. awesome and yeah, I, and I love to analyze things yeah no me too me too and uh, as i said i think it's a what it's almost a shame in a way because i do think that i mean with both i mean because i mean there are obviously huge parallels between our countries a uh, massive culture mm-hmm you know overlaps you know all of our movies have british and american actors in and things like that and yeah but um i say with both of our countries it, one thing that makes me sad a little bit is as i said certain areas of our societies that i think are getting worse are down to um like the the are very much clearly attached to the faith going down yeah. you know the lack of that that the the destruction of maybe uh, a more sort of religious style family. Yeah, I feel like faith contributes a lot to family structure. And, 100%. And family function, you know. And, of course, sometimes that's not the case, but mm. just in a general way, I do think that a family that believes in something mm. is probably more likely to have a reason to stay together through a hard time or, you know, just different things like that because you have a little bit of a glue where maybe without something that's a common belief you don't really have a lot of glue like, i think that like, you just like even like you know you're just taking something like say like being a father or a mother you're just going to take that way more seriously yeah something like that yeah. raising your kids it's just suddenly totally. way more seriously and i think you there's yeah. so much evidence for that you see religious families and as, and as we were saying earlier you know obviously you know on the flip coin of that of course you have like the extremists and the more occultist type mm-hmm. people and the stuff and obviously yeah you know there there are some some bad examples of religious people but i think you know just say like more like i say i would say like um i'd say like the christian people from our say our grandparents generation just take let's just take them as an example like i think you see the family communities we're like better on the whole looked after each other yeah yeah and it's really cool to it's much like music hmm. um it a faith is transverses is that the right word it it crosses hmm. um cultures and yeah. languages too and it was cool i had um well i've gone out of the country many times for mission trips but um i went to armenia uh with my dad once and i took my banjo and um i was we were teaching a vbs bible school thing but we were also teaching english um and it was to this rural like mountain village of kids and stuff and we worked with the local natives there um, just to kind of like teach Bible lessons and we did songs and I played banjo for the kids. That was cool because I kicked off like a, but don't, 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 don't. And like immediately they started clapping and dancing. <laughs> like it was, and they'd never heard, you know, Foggy Mountain Breakdown before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like so like moved because I was like, man, you know, I don't speak their language at yeah. all. And I'm from literally on the other side of the planet and like, they they can connect with this music and then um i think one of the most beautiful moments of my life was like the local pastor there was praying with a few of the kids and like to me i was just like wow like i'm on the other side of the world and like people here believe in like the same god that i do like yeah it's just crazy yeah yeah instant connection because like didn't speak the same language or anything like but we were able to just like feel comfortable with each other because we all believe the same thing, you know? And I think and that's, that's so important cool. as well, isn't it? Because obviously if you don't feel like you have anything in common with somebody, they're going to feel alien to you and maybe yeah. make you feel uncomfortable or something, you know? All you right. need is that little yeah. spark of connection and you yeah. sort of feel at home with yeah. them. I know. I was, I definitely 
the one thing I couldn't get hip to with their culture was that they do like espresso shots at like 8 p.m. <laughs> and, That's, yeah, yeah. And man, I did not sleep good the whole time I was there because I was like, okay, I guess I got to partake. I'm trying yeah. to like, you know. And, that's, but, a, that's a yeah. weird thing in Europe. I mean, that's a weird thing in Europe. It's like, um, I mean, to be honest, they do it in the UK as well. I mean, that's not like quite as big as, say, in some countries like Italy and places like that. But it's a very mm-hmm. like common thing. Like more when you go out for a meal, not like when you're at home. But like, it's like, yeah, you have your dinner in the evening and then you'd have like a, an espresso or a coffee. coffee. Yeah. And really I weird. was like, man, really? Like, are we doing... Let's get wired to go home and go to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit strange, was- isn't it? It was not my favorite part of that trip, but that's okay. I had a lot of favorite parts. And I Is, didn't need good sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who needs that? Whatever. Do you, do you reckon that's why your um? Is that why your parents um homeschooled you because of religion or? Um, I think definitely like a percentage contributed to that, but in the town where I grew up, and I don't want to speak horribly about it online, but <laughs> like the. the the local high school in the town I grew up in had like really bad um, ratings on ACT scores and high ratings on pregnancies. Ah, so they were that's they good were incentive. just like they were like, eh, let's mm. not do that because not only are they maybe not going to have a great education, but there's just a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm I'm interested as a, as a parent myself because me and my missus talk all the time about how we'd like to homeschool our child, but we just don't think oh, yeah. it's really realistic because we both have to work. So, did your dad, pardon me, did your dad work and your mum sort of was your teacher? Is that how it sort of worked? Yeah, yeah, and and at a certain age, we basically did our own stuff. Like, um, you know, she used curriculums, so like she would get all the books and then you know as we were super little when we were little like she would get us started on things and like show us which which lesson in the book and then there was like there was always like a reading book and then a workbook book and so we would do the reading and then we would do the workbook section so she would like highlight what we needed to do or whatever mm. and then uh basically we we just would do all that ourselves and then you know in in high school there were a few other homeschool moms that were also public school teachers and so like they or they had been teachers and they would do substitute teaching and stuff so they like one of my friends down the street I could just walk to her house like her mom taught us like chemistry and biology out of some books and then um there's like a lot of co-ops too like maybe once a week, like all the homeschool families would get together at this one place, and like mm. whoever had teaching skills, yeah, you know, sure. would be teaching some classes, and all the kids would be doing that, and then all the homeschool moms would like hang out, you know. Mm-hmm. So. It's good that there was like a big enough community of homeschooling where you were to do that. Yeah, there were definitely like a pretty good homeschool community, also with the same mindset of like higher education like all the homeschoolers I was around their parents were like definitely bent on them being able to get scholarships Mm. because like there's a lot of big families so like nobody's going to be paying for anybody's um, college tuition so like all of us got our own scholarship you know for college and things like that um, based on academics or whatever Mm. some sports but Homeschool sports were definitely lacking as far mm. as like the level. Um, <clears throat> did you but, did you enjoy sports? Did you ever do any sports? Yeah, I played. Um, I I did ballet for nine years, which awesome. some people maybe wouldn't think of as a sport. But it I think is. I saw you. I <laughs> think I saw a video of you doing some oh, cool yeah. ballet stuff in the street on like your Instagram or something. Yeah, I recently. just I just filmed um, one of the music videos for a new song. Um, it's going to be on the record. I did a ballet music video, and that was like my first time of getting ballet out of the um, drawer, kind of to try to do it. So I had to kind of, I did a couple of months of no lifting, just running and walking and yoga and ballet to get ready for that. But I think it's going to be cool um, because I'm excited to use that that form of art um, mm. with this song, but. So I cool. did that for nine years, and then I did um, 
high school volleyball for a few years, and then I played college volleyball, and I even was on the college basketball team for like two months, but that was not my strong suit. I'm way too small for yeah, college sure, basketball, sure. like because yeah, it's yeah. a contact sport. So volleyball is different because you're not like impacting yeah. physically yeah. the other team. But I was not the same size as the girls sure. um, for the basketball, and I was just How not tall are you? strong enough. I'm like five four, but okay. Like these girls were like six foot yeah, sure. one and stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> they were like. The coach was like, okay, so do you just want to stand here, do some free throws so that all of our tall girls can practice, like, getting it off of the net or, you know, the rim or whatever, and I wasn't even good for that because I was actually (laughs) good at free throws, and so they wouldn't bounce off, and so I was like, okay, I guess I'm useless for you guys. So I would just sing the anthem for them, (laughs) (laughs) Um, for the games, (laughs) but yeah, I... I always wanted to do track, but I never got around to it. But, yeah, volleyball was kind of my main sport, I guess. So did you say you're still pretty active now? Did you say that um, – you, did you say you stopped lifting weights for your ballet? Is that what you stopped Yeah, so do you but lift now weights I'm back to it. Yeah. So, yeah. so I like lifting. Yeah, so like what do you – so what's like a like a week in your sort of like fitness regime, if you want to call it that? So like what do you do? Let's see. Um – an ideal week mm-hmm. would be probably like two times lifting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, instead of doing, because I'm not going every day, um, full that's body. just too much. Um, then I just do two times full body instead of like arm day, leg day, arm day, leg Pro day. Pro splits blah, aren't blah, the most blah. effective anyway. <laughs> full body. Yeah, I mean, way. I did a lot of that in college because mm. we had a pretty strict workout routines for the volleyball team but so we were working out every day but i just don't think it's important for me to work out every day yeah, i've got sure. too you're, much to do you're a, job, <laughs> you're a musician yeah yeah you want to be well-rounded you just so, want to be fit and healthy and... yeah i definitely i try to get a walk every day if nothing mm-hmm. um but yeah so i'll i'll go to the gym like twice a week and do kind of like a little bit of cardio, and then arms, legs, abs, or whatever, and then... Um, Do you just sort of like free weights the, or machines or a bit of everything, calisthenics? What a little sort of bit of both. Bit yeah, of a little bit of both. Um, unfortunately, the gym that I have a membership at, because it's really cheap, doesn't have as much free weight like rack options, so mm-hmm. I have to do like the Smith machine, they're like sure. fixed racks. Yeah. Um, but I... I do some like free weights for arms and stuff like that, and then um, there's some really cool ab machines there that I um, feel like are finally doing something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, but then yeah, I'll do like the stair stepper or something to get my yeah. heart rate up. You know, Ugh, stair steppers are freaking they're <laughs> they're difficult. But um, then on all the other days i'll either take a walk or sometimes a run or something like that so that's awesome i just like to stay active yeah me and you both i think it's awesome. I've always been that way <laughs> yeah me and you both Brian. i think like the thing is it makes you just feel better and it makes life easier yes. and i think you know like yes. strength is never a weakness and you right, know if you're yeah. a stronger if you're a strong fit version of yourself that's going to benefit you and everyone around you isn't it Yes, yeah. I think especially for lugging a banjo around um, mm-hmm. places and then, like, it's just there's a lot of physically taxing stuff that you end up doing, I guess, as a musician, like helping load out or load into Caps a gig, and you amps know. and speakers. Yeah, there's just a lot. And then, um, yeah, especially just for my height, I want to be strong so people don't think I'm, like, a little weakling. A little pocket so. rocket. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It's like I ain't no shrimp, you know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Just to finish off, um would you be happy to finish with some quick fire questions? Oh yeah. I always like to do exciting. this at the end. It's it's just like funny little questions and it's like a good way for people to hear like just some random bits of trivia about people. Um yeah. so what's your favorite movie? Uh, um I'll just say bringing up baby. Okay. I've heard of that, it's but I haven't seen it. What's Harry it about? Grant and oh, Catherine I have Frank. seen that because my mum's a big oh. fan of it, isn't it? Yes. That's not the one where they're stranded on like an island, is it? 
That's a different no, character. There's a movie. leopard. A leopard, a leopard like right. gets out of the zoo and they they have to get it back to the zoo and it's tame. But then there's this other leopard and yeah, it's, I've, Harry I did, Grant is my favorite actor. Really. So. He yes. is from, um, I believe, he either is from or he died in Bristol, which is the closest city to us in England. So it's so Bristol is literally, if you oh, wow. drove, what do you reckon, Drew, 40, 45 minutes north of where we are, you'd get to Bristol City. And I can't oh, cool. remember if that's where he was from or where he died or both, but there's a big statue of, of Cary Grant in Bristol and that's where he was from. Aw, I have to go visit that one day. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, so I, I said I definitely because my mum was a big fan of Cary Grant. She watched lots of his movies, and I did sit through a couple of them when I was a little lad. But um, I can't remember the details on it. But bringing a baby, I knew that rang a bell. And as soon as you yeah. said Cary Grant, it's I was a like, hilarious oh, I've seen that. one. Yeah. It's really funny movie. I like that your favorite movie is such a classic classical movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, we only watched black and white movies for yeah. like the first ten years of my life. So yeah. <laughs> One thing I like really like about you, Brenner, is it, Brenner, is how old-fashioned you are, and I think it's good. <laughs> and I think it's definitely going to serve you in your life rather than take away. But um, yeah. Um, what's your favorite food? <sighs> These are just tough to pick. Um, you can, you can mention a couple if you like. All food so much. Let's see. I love Italian food. Mm. I love Mate, who doesn't like rich breads and pastas. Oh yeah. Yes, like just. <laughs> any of them but i just have to be careful with that because sometimes I'm, i get hypoglycemic stuff going so i have to do a lot of protein if i'm going to go with the pasta yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah, but sure. um and then i love i love thai food oh um, yeah a yeah, lot again, like great choice. green curry red curry yeah or sushi anything yeah yeah I mean, yeah i'm very i'm not picky so like thai and italian mainly you reckon those, I mean, yeah, they're two of my um, favorites as well. Mexican food, though, I mean, I love rice. Mexican and food is and great. <laughs> Burritos, I love a burrito. Yes, like a good burrito. Yes. Um, and, I mean, I think like uh, you know, I love the whole sort of uh, like American barbecue food though as well. You know. Oh yeah, I love that too. But because that's really I mean, taken off in the UK, like now. I mean, it's very common in the UK as well. But like the oh, amount of places, really? you know, there's like lots of there's like chains called like Bear Grylls over here in the UK, and there's lots of other more like independent ones, like really good ones. There's one in Bristol, the city we were just talking about, called like mm. uh, Spitfire, and the amount of just like really slow pulled pork ribs and beef briskets yeah. and everything is so good, man. Briskets, pretty good, yeah. Yeah. And green beans, I love green beans. So good. So like, it's like just so. Man, it's just so delicious, so so tasty, so flavorful. <laughs> um, what's your favorite color? Green. Me too. Um, what keeps you up at night? That's a bit deep, um, isn't it? Yes. Um, Anything like in general or at the moment or both? I usually sleep really well due to um, my the things that go along with my day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, no, fair play fair play i usually fall asleep really well cool 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 so you don't ever really have any issues like that you never like sort of lay, lay awake like what like worrying about anything or anything particular or yeah not really um just 420 yeah 420 <laughs> all the way <laughs> awesome well that's amazing well yeah I've absolutely like loved Good talking. recommendation. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, that's one of the things they say, though, isn't it? It's like one of the things it's best for is like, yeah, sleeping. Yeah, you know? I don't, I don't usually have any problems. If anything, I'll wake up before my alarm sometimes because I experienced such deep sleep, and then that's frustrating because I just want that last hour of sleep so bad. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's annoying. I hate when that okay. happens. I hate that when it happens. Yeah. Is there, is there anything else that you'd like to say, Brenner, or anything before we finish? Is there anything you want to like plug or say or oh, like yeah. a message or anything? Um, Empty your thoughts. Um, I mean, I would plug my album that'll yeah. be coming out sometime sure. this year. Uh, you know, it's my first one, so I want it to hit hard and keep rolling for me. So, As I said, we'll make sure we play know. it on AW Radio. Um, cool. you know, if you send us some singles and stuff and whatever and then uh, hopefully you know if yeah. you're happy to the whole album when it when it you've, you've got it and i'll play every song man 
Oh man, well thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't heard every. There's some piano on there. There's some steel guitar on there. There's some drums. It's crazy. You know, I there's like a few trad. There's there's a huge variety on there, but it's all stuff I've written besides the one song, and that's a very traditional song. So um, I'm excited for people to hear it. And yeah, I guess I would just plug the album and um, you know just supporting that and like you can just follow along on my instagram's probably like my most common used thing that i do yeah. online um so what's your instagram are trying to like it's brenna macmillan official and it does have the check mark just because <laughs> just to be fancy yes yeah, just to be fancy but like there's so <laughs> many people that have fake accounts I yeah. don't know why. There's no benefit well, of, in pretending to be me. There's loads of fake Brenna McMillan accounts. <laughs> is it? That's there crazy. There are. Yes. And Freaks. I get so many messages. <laughs> and I think people try to get money fr- from people. Yeah. And so I I highly rebuke that behavior. Well, karma is going to um, come get them. Yes. yes. It's not and a good way to only, live your life. The only time I've ever asked asked for money is... This year, with the launching of the GoFundMe, so, like, and there's only one place you can donate to for that, so, like, if it's not through my website, then just don't even fiddle with it, you know? Sure. Like, because I wouldn't trust pretty much anything else. I mean, (laughs) my website's linked on Instagram, too, but, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just like my album. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, 100%. As I said, said, we'll play it. We'll play all of it, because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to listen to it. As I said, like ever oh, yeah. since I sort of checked out your stuff, I thought, you know, awesome musician. Um, I said the mu- the songs I have heard of yours, freaking love them. So yeah, I'm lo- really looking forward to checking out your album. I was going to say um, as well, you know, if um, you ever want to come to the UK or plans to come to the UK and want any help, um, like whether it's just getting gigs in the UK, um, when you're visiting Bristol to see Cary Grant statue, or yes. <laughs> um, if you're ever around for some reason, you know, we'll help you get gigs. We'll welcome you into the studio. Um, oh, all that good stuff and just try and make sure that you're well catered for in the UK okay, oh, well thank you I appreciate no. that no my pleasure yes, thank you I, for, for today I'll definitely have to do like an anchor gig in Bristol so that I can see the statue and then yeah we'll 100% be, and we're like, we'll hook you, you know? up with all the good like sort of like folky like um, pubs and bars and scenes around here oh, as well cool. that'd be awesome nice. thanks so much thanks. for coming on Brian I really that. appreciate your time yeah thank you I enjoyed this so. <laughs> cheers everyone